<laughs> Thanks for joining us again at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. I'm Ryan. Uh, with Hellraiser back in the spotlight, Jose, Rob, and I thought we'd revisit the old Marvel epic Hellraiser comics. Starting from the beginning, we discuss issues one through four. Did you collect these back in the early 90s? Do you have them now? This is episode 170. And if you um, have some ideas or, or uh, thoughts on this, you can leave us a comment on the show notes at CliveBarkerCast.com. We also have a Discord channel if you want to find us in there. Uh, there's a link on the website, www.CliveBarkerCast.com, uh, where you, we can talk about it on Facebook or Twitter. Okay, anyway, without any further ado, here we go. This is episode 170 of the Clive Barker podcast, and we're going to start talking about the Marvel uh, Hellraiser comics from 1989 through, I think, 93. Is that right? I can check that real quick for you, yeah. Um, let's see. So how many comics came out? Was it, uh, 20 plus, uh, plus two, a holiday special, a Christmas or uh, summer special. And, um, and, uh, the, uh, adaptation of Hellraiser. Hellraiser three. three yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. The, the, a lot of comics there. Yeah. 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 So cool. Um, yeah, these came out through Marvel's, uh, Epic imprint. And, uh, like you said, the first issue came out in, uh, 1989 and it was a, a real groundbreaker in terms of like uh, they were bringing out it was it was done in uh, anthology format and uh, they brought all their a talent um, to the table to make stories for Hellraiser do you guys yeah. know know if epic existed before these Hellraiser comics oh yeah yeah it's it certainly did there was a big famous uh, epic series I think it was called elf quest. Oh. And uh, it went on for years and years. Hmm. So yeah. Okay. So anything that they wanted that wasn't part of the over the the big Marvel universe, they yes, want, they would put in Epic. It was kind of like Marvel's uh, Vertigo in or print, D I guess. Kind of darker. It's kind of like darker material. You mean DC's yeah. Vertigo? Yeah. Yeah, DC's Vertigo. Yes, thank yeah. you. I think it was kind of like that. It was the stuff that was more independent, and I think that authors got to keep their characters and stuff like that. It was, oh. it was like a small indie label inside of Marvel. Hmm. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So I had read some of these over the years, but uh, this will be the first time that I'm reading them all. So I'm kind of excited about that. I really? Have, yeah. I have most yeah. of them. I have, I think, three quarters of the books, but I don't have all of them. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, this will be my first time too, so I'm really looking forward to it. Oh wow! Okay. Well, for I only years... had like I only had like about four hard copies. Okay. Of uh -huh. um, the issues, and one of them I do have three and four from that uh, from the books we've uh, read. We're going to do in this episode, but right. I never had a, I've never really had time to read them. So this is going to be you know going to be reading some you know great Hellraiser material that I've yeah. never read before. Yeah, for sure. I um, for years and years, all I had was numbers one through four, because um, I got them in Portugal, where I come from. We used to get comic books imported from Brazil, so they came in in Brazilian Portuguese, which we could probably we could read. Obviously, I mean clearly, but it's it's a little different. But anyway, so I got the old uh, um, Hellraiser comics coming in from Brazil, translated in Portuguese. Unfortunately. They only translated one through four, and um, they never really did the whole 20-issue run, 20 issue run. So for a long time, all I had was the four issues that we we're going to discuss. So I kind of got to know them very, very intimately because yeah. uh, I read them over and over. Um, but definitely for someone like me who, you know, in, in 1990, 1991, I was like watching Hellraiser for the first times. And um, maybe, maybe earlier than that, maybe – Maybe 80, 88, 89, I guess, because it, it hit Portugal and after it came out. But anyway, so I really got into it in the 90s, right? So that's when I started actually, like, looking at Hellraiser. It became the gateway stuff for a Clyde Barker work. And, uh, yeah, this was great. I mean, this was – I was already a Marvel reader, so i have been reading Marvel comics since I was a child. And so, yeah, this was just another, another – um, Interesting thing to add to the mythology of Hellraiser for me. It really opened it up for me. 
Yeah, they really do. The stories uh, expand on really a lot of the mythology with the box and the Cenobites in uh, interesting ways, especially in these f- first four books. Right. So I like the. And- the editor for this was Daniel Chichester, who was also the editor for the uh, uh, Nightbreed comics, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. So sorry, you were going to say? I like the different styles of art and how they uh, – somehow it just all comes together nicely. Really, really good artwork in these, especially oh, the yeah. covers. All the covers are really great. Yeah, yeah. The covers are amazing, yeah. Well – um, the thing is, before they started the series, they actually came up with what's called the Hellraiser Bible, which is a document that was created that was – I mentioned this before uh, many times. It was the concepts and guidelines for a horror anthology series from Epic Comics, and this was done with uh, Clive Barker and Dan Chichester and a few other people. So we can put a link to that in the show notes. This this Hellraiser Bible of sorts was a uh, just a few pages, but the, these pages set up the – the guidelines for what what is Hellraiser, what sort of stories are we looking for in this anthology series, and oh, you know nice. what's yeah what's behind of this. So it, it it's like a little bit of a press kit, but for a comic book series. So if you get a press kit, uh, the old time press kits for movies, you get like these photocopied pages where they say what's the movie about, who are the characters, who are the who is the cast, and you know what what is the, the the reviews that we got when we were screening this and stuff. So this is kind of the same thing. So they go over what's Hellraiser, who's Clive Barker, um, what is Clive Barker's Hellraiser supposed to be about, and uh, who are the people who are involved in editing this comic book. It's a very informative thing. Uh, Building the mythology, like they mentioned that, what's Leviathan? uh, says here, at the center of hell stands a perfect icon of evil, an enormous diamond-shaped being called Leviathan. And turning endlessly, Leviathan is the true creator of all the boxes and puzzles that lie scattered through the planes of reality, boxes and puzzles that, once solved, open the doorway to hell. And then it goes on to mention, you know, how these, how these boxes are made uh, from the flesh of Leviathan, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, it, it mentioned that uh, there were like 10,000 uh, puzzles or something sent, scattered throughout the universe. So in this series that they're going to be following what happens to people when they... When they find these puzzles, right? And what's the what's the war on flesh? Like declaring war on flesh. Uh, so it says here in many tales of horror, the denizens of the night threaten the orderly world of good with the chaos of evil. In the world of Clive Barker's Hellraiser, it is order which fuels the evil of Leviathan, and it is chaos that acts as the delineator for man and the forces of good. It goes on and on and on. So it's it's very interesting if you want to read this first. If you're not it, if you're not a big Clyde Barker or a Hellraiser fan, but you're listening to this, this will tell you all you need to know about Hellraiser. That's really interesting. I mean, and it, it, I think the reason that one reason that I never read these before is because I I, I was uh, getting sort of overwhelmed by the amount of of tangential Clive Barker related stuff there was, and so I had made a decision early in my collecting that I was only going to do deal with stuff that was written by Clive Barker. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of why I'm coming around to to this this stuff now. You know, as we're doing the podcast, that's but, perfectly understandable, I guess. Yeah, but he is. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't know that I realized at the time how much uh, how involved he was in in things like the the Hellraiser and Nightbreed comics, even if he wasn't writing them directly. Sure, I mean in this series he will be writing a couple of, of issues uh, when he mentions oh. the uh, the harrowers, I think, mm-hmm. in in a couple of issues near the end. I think Clyde Barker did write something for that, but uh, yeah, yeah, the, he was really involved with this, and uh, yeah, but ultimately also the editors were the people who were making the big decisions about uh, what stories to include and what they wanted to tell the artists about what Hellraiser was supposed to be. Don't don't you um, kind of miss the days when uh, when when Hellraiser, um, people involved with Hellraiser were respectful for what Clive Barker wanted with the franchise. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> you can you can right. tell like uh, all the stories feel like something Clive Barker has approved or would love. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. I mean like a lot of different you know stories from like different time periods, and I think that's what Clive really wanted the the box you know to show how like the box and the Cenobites to be that it just didn't. It, uh, kind of like a uh, how uh, 
this is something that is a uh, has been going around uh, you know uh, for centuries, not just you know you know like in the movies that presented it like the present day kind of thing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like when Bl Bloodline when they wanted to show the box. Uh, yeah. And the evil of the the Hellraiser box, like pervading this series of of generations of a family, like of yeah. the architect that created it, and even this concepts and guidelines for the Hellraiser anthology series, it goes on to mention about the puzzle boxes and and what they are. It says here something like, like H. P. Lovecraft's Necronomicon, the idea of Leviathan's puzzles should take on a life of their own, pervading everything around them. Any puzzle anywhere should begin to make both the characters in the stories and our readers slightly neurotic, worried as to what will happen should they solve it. Each box is unique for each person, a different puzzle requiring a different solution, a solution that is a ritual. It can never be easy to solve the box. It is something someone has to work at and something someone has to want, which is... Is something that they did in the comic books, but they didn't really do it in the movies for the sake of, of hu hurrying the story along, right? Yeah. <laughs> People just touch the box, and the box practically opens itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was wasn't there a scene in Deader where somebody threw it across the floor and yeah. it, and it opened. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> and even in the in the latest movie, Re Revelations. I mean. Um, Revel I mean, judgment, judgment, judgment. judgment. I'm sorry. Yeah, judgment. Uh, and even in the last movie, Judgment, it's like two people in panic with a gun pointed at them, and they just know exactly what to touch in the box to open it. And it's like, um, yeah, it's just for the sake of the story. But you know, that was always something that's bothered me. But in these stories, no, they actually show people spending years of of yearning for something, and 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 spending time and getting yeah. obsessed by their compulsion to open the box, and. Uh, it really respects that whole idea of, of the ritual. Yeah. Yeah. And in the and like, heart, it took Kirsty hours in the hospital and she was only able to open it because she could see the grooves because there was blood in them. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just, it, these books kind of went back to the stuff I like about, like, I guess you were saying, Jose, about the yearning of desire and, you know, uh, pain and pleasure. Mm hmm. Things like yeah. that. And I was noticing and, that it seems like most of the characters in this book have a place where they could stop, you know, where they could they they they, they see a place where they could, you know, where they're, they're at a point of no return and they could go forward or they could just quit and, and, and give up and they were right. fine. It's, and they typically, you know, of their own free will, they they pass through and, and uh, kind of go beyond where they there's there's no hope of redemption or coming back. Yeah, and one thing I like about these Cenobites in the stories is that they surprise you. They surprise you because they're not just uh, mindless demons. They didn't just turn them into mindless demons. They actually paid attention to the guidelines that they had here, and they there's more stuff here about what the Cenobites are supposed to be like, and it says that, uh, that the Cenobites are... <clears throat> the uh, shock troops of Leviathan, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it, there's a lot of stuff here. But um, it says here, the puzzles wait, each indestructible and watched over by a guardian angel, or in this case, demon, a creature blending in with those around. As the grumpy guy at the newsstand, as the hairdresser on the corner, as little Tommy's unruly house cat, uh, as the weird old bum wandering around is that box's guardian, each guardian seeing that each box reaches the hands of a prospective candidate of hell. So it, it goes on, it, it wrote very well defined here. Like they explained to the artists really what they had to do. And, and even the Cenobites sometimes are capable of mercy of a sorts. And, and, you know, I mean, there's one story that we're going to mention here. It's called Dance of the Fetus, where mm -hmm. innocence is important for the Cenobites. They're not just there to pervert people or to, um, take you know, souls and, yeah. take yeah. souls uh, without any sort of rhyme or reason. They actually have to follow their own strict uh, orderly conduct uh, set by Leviathan. Yeah, the code, like a code. Yeah. Like like in Hellraiser three, when Pinhead can't take the box from Joey, has to be given to him, right? Yeah. I don't think that's happened in any other movie, uh, <laughs> right? Except right. maybe yeah, the first right. and second, yeah. But but after that, it's like that Pinhead just does what he wants. He just chops people's heads off and all that. It's just <laughs> right. uh, yeah. It's yeah. The comics were much better here, and they and they expanded the the whole uh, roster of of Cenobites, and I really love that. 
And so in this episode, we'll be talking about uh, the first four issues. We were originally going to do five issues, but once we, you know, for me, once I saw how long they were, one, I didn't think that I could get through five in time before we recorded, and also, I think it would make for a really long episode mm -hmm. to do five issues. So we're kind of, you know, adjusting as we go along. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, yeah. This first issue has a really iconic cover that has been made into a hell, a really popular Hellraiser poster. I think I had one of these also. I had one of these posters. I probably do still somewhere. Yeah, I have one of these too. I think it was a promotional poster yeah. um, for, yeah, for Marvel Comics, yeah. It's a classic image of Pinhead. Yeah, with the fire around him and he's looking up at the... It's just... You know, he's looking up at the reader before they turn the page. It's like, yeah. turn, the, turn the page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, this is uh, this is uh, painted by John Bolton, and that's uh, it's pretty mind blowing. I think yeah. it's it's a heck of an opening for the first issue. Yeah. So, um, and then the the first so there's a there's an introduction by Dan Chichester, the um, the uh, editor editor. Yeah, and then another, and then an introduction by Clive Barker also, um, where he's kind of, it's kind of stuff that he said in other other places, basically talking about Hellraiser doesn't just belong to him, it, you know, it's taken on its own life and belongs to the fans, and he's happy that you know his monsters have become part of the pantheon of monsters. Uh huh. And he goes on here to say. Um, and lo and behold, the little bastard movie I made's got a life of its own. Who'd have thought it? Who'd have who who would have ever thought? And that's yeah. Clive Barker's signature yeah. at the bottom. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, and it opens with the Canons of Pain, which uh, takes us back to uh, the Crusades. Crusades. Yeah. yeah, and these were the were these the French Crusades, right? I think so. Yeah, it was the, the Knights Templar, right? They were going throughout uh, the Middle East and uh, the lands of the Levant, and they were, uh, they were, you know, spreading the the faith and stealing holy relics to take back to the the old world. Yeah, and um, and this this I should have written more character names down, but this uh, this oh, it's the Count Carillion. Yeah, he 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 was really kind of disappointed that they lost so many lives and fought so hard just to get this basically box. a stupid box yeah yeah he doesn't understand its true power yeah right right so and and of course he becomes uh obsessed by this because they fought so hard they they lost so many men and then he doesn't even know like the box is not even mentioned the gospels he he thought he was going to find something like like the nails of the cross or like the, yeah. the bones of some saint or apostle or something and mm -hmm. um it was a thing i mean <laughs> If you know the stuff about relics and uh, especially saint relics and holy relics, it's crazy that some some saints seem to have had like twenty fingers and uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, right. and, and and eight limbs and stuff like that. So it's like you go to a church, especially in Europe in the old world, uh, and you will find like these uh, mummified bodies on display on an altar in a church or this skull that's ornamented with like jewelry and and drape you know, draped in like gold and purple and, uh, or sometimes a little, uh, reliquary that has like a, Oh, this is the knuckle of St. John, whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's not true. I mean, I've, I've looked into those things <laughs> yeah. and it's like some of them may be, uh, the actual person they mentioned, but most of those were just, were just things that they made. Um, and they would just say, okay, let's say that this knuckle is from St. Sebastian or something. And let's put it here in this, in this church and people will come in and they'll bring uh, offerings and, and, you know, they'll yeah. do pilgrimages. And it was just another way for the church to get people to come in and, and do offerings and pray and, and, and do devotion to these saints. Sometimes they were just some guy's knuckle that they would turn into like <laughs> a relic. <laughs> just some guy. Huh? And, and this, yeah. this story, the canons of pain was, was written by Eric Saltzgaber, which I think he was also a writer for Nightbreed, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And uh, and art by John Bolton, who did that awesome cover that we were just talking about. Yeah, I do have a page of original art from this uh, story, painted by John Bolton. So I've been trying to sell it. <laughs> just I'm just laying it out here. I've been trying oh. to sell that page. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's with that uh, that blobby Cenobite guy, right? Yeah, your, your yeah, art. yeah. 
how, yeah, how, yeah. how big is that piece of art you're trying to sell? Is oh, uh, it's on, pretty big. Looks like page is that uh, twelve, right? Is where yes, your, your I think art so. comes from. Yeah, that big yeah. that big uh, close up of that that uh, Cenobite. Cenobite. Space. Yes, that's when uh, Count Carillion. So basically, the story in broad line strokes is that uh, so the Count Carillion went to the Levant, did crusades, found a box inside an altar, and took it with him to Europe. And then he was so upset that he didn't know what the box was that he just it was a it was consuming him. He was like, I, I don't know, I've lost my way. I don't know why I was taken to find this box, and uh, it's just a useless box. And then the wife. She becomes uh, devoted to the church, and she decides to find out the meaning of the box so she can put her husband's mind at ease. Yeah, and then, of course, that Monsignor. Yeah, the Monsignor. So. Yeah, it was a nice twist for this story because you expect, you know, a simpler version would have been just that this, that this Templar got obsessed with the box. But uh, it was kind of interesting that he you know he's, he's uh, he's weary and and lost his faith, and so the wife, it feels like she needs to to make up for it. Yeah. And so <clears throat> so the the Monsignor and the wife end up opening the box. And when that happens, um, of course, you know, hell, hell breaks loose, so to speak. Yeah. And and the Count Carillion ends up being the guy who is taken uh, because he shows up. But then he is impaled in all these like spikes and he's taken by the the Cenobite. And then at the end, uh, the Monsignor kind of does a blessing and says, oh, be gone, Lucifer, be gone. And the, and the Cenobite's like, all right, yeah, I already got the guy, so I'm just going to go. And he just disappears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, for the Monsignor and the Carillion wife, they think that he was Satan. And they want to make sure that uh, – they want to know if they can exercise the demon or, or – um, rid mankind of Satan's presence somehow. I mean, that's kind of a, like a yeah. hubris kind of position to take. Right. You're just like people. You're going to go up against Satan. I mean, oh, that's thinking the power of God is behind you or something. But wasn't, yeah. wasn't there a movie like this? Was it the exorcism of Emily Rose where it, it was like her uncle or something was, was secretly got her. He did some ritual to get her possessed so that he could, uh, so that he could get to, you know, bring the devil out so that he could get to know him, so that he could beat him somehow. I think you're thinking about something else. Maybe a movie called The Haunting. I can't remember. I don't know because yeah. the exorcism of Emily Rose is just a teenage girl who is possessed, and the parents bring a, a priest to exorcise her. Yeah, so, but um, I thought it had turned out that it was the priest's fault all along. Well, well, the the real life case of Annalisa Michael was that yeah, the the priests kind of enabled the parents and they let the girl like, you know, they didn't give her proper medical care that she needed, and so yeah, she ended up starving and dying of right. no, of, but I'm of just abuse. Talking about the movie, not the. I mean, the movie. Oh, was yeah, yeah, Supposed yeah. to be based on a true story, but it wasn't. You know. Right. Right. That was Scott Dickerson, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Scott Derrickson, the same guy Derrickson, who did yeah. Hellraiser Inferno and the yeah. the Day the Earth Stood Still remake. But I. I'm not sure. I mean, I've seen that movie. I don't remember anything about the uncle trying to get his uh, he, he niece might possessed. Be, I'm, I'm, there was a bunch of possession movies at the same, oh, yeah. around the same time. There have been a bunch yeah. of possession movies and over the years. I may be confusing it with a different one, but there was one where this girl was possessed, and it turned out that the priest had sort of secretly done a ritual and caused it to happen. Yeah. Because well, he wanted to beat the devil. <laughs> uh, I remember, for example, another story – of Clyde Barker's where he does that, uh, down Satan when, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Gregory, the guy wanted, he, he was a millionaire and he wanted to build a hell on earth so that the devil would come right. And be right. trapped. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, in this case, of course, these guys, uh, uh, the Count Carillion's wife and, uh, the Monsignor, they end up summoning the, the Cenobite again. Right. And, um, and so, they throw holy water at him, and it's like <laughs> nothing happens. And, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and then and then uh, he says, "Well, if God really existed, why do, do you guys think that He would even like give you any of His power to fight me?" I mean, it, and 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 basically, the Cenobite just does what he wants, impales the Monsignor, and he's about to leave and then take the wife with him when she says, well, you, you have to take all of us? Is there no <laughs> no mercy? And it's like, um, 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, I already got my fill. So, yeah, I, I guess one of you will stay. <laughs> yeah. And so what he does is, uh, yeah, the wife was pregnant. And so yeah. Yeah. the Cenobite summons the ghost of her dead husband who was in hell. And he shows up with a sword. And then we hear the scream. And what's left behind is just the baby, the unborn baby, um, who is now the successor to the Karelian dynasty. And uh, it says that the Karelian dynasty will walk a path of, of, of shadows, darkness. of darkness. So, yeah. So does this Cenobite have a name? I think that's the only reason he didn't make it into our duels of blood is because I don't think he has a name, does he? This might be the only comic that he appears in. Yeah, um, he does have a name. Um, Grillard, I think. Oh. That's his name. He shows up. I uh, either shows up in another story, or I read his name somewhere, okay. maybe on a script or something. Well, so it's and we'll find out as we go along. But he's an interesting, uh, an interesting character. Oh yeah, yeah. And very, very strange. And people have an opportunity to buy an original art piece of him. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I'll put it up again. I've yeah. been sharing it every once in a while. So yeah. it's it's a great um, it's a great piece of artwork. It's very big. And we'll have a link in the show notes also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. This, this was a cool story. I, I, um, I like that one. It was just really strong opening and, and it kind of tells you that, Hey, no, this is not going to be just retelling Hellraiser for people reading this for the first time. It's like, it's not going to be retelling of Hellraiser and that, that it's uh -huh. a larger world. There are more Cenobites yeah. than, than just the four that you know from Hellraiser. Yeah. So it's cool. Mm hmm. And it takes like us to different uh, different sets, right? Different times in history, different vignettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of what I was going to say. I like the whole crusade aspect. Yeah. Yeah, that was a dark time. Dark times. Um, yeah. I like, and then it, I love the artwork by uh, – who was the artist on this one? Um, John, John Bolton. Bolton. Yeah, the, guy, the yeah. same guy that did the cover. Yes. Big fantasy illustrator. Uh a master of, of illustration, really. And uh, he even did that. Uh, he did an adaptation of Dracula, I think, uh, oh, wow. which I, I really recommend. Um, so, yeah. And and going from the Crusades to like the. Uh, the Wild West. The Wild yeah. Wild West. Yeah. yeah that's Dead, Dead Man's, Man's Hand. Hand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this one was written by W or Shelley Fish and art by Dan Spiegel. Mm hmm. Um, all, all really like uh, great, great artists and writers, and uh, and this story, it's it's pretty cool. So like the Puzzle Guardian, this must be the most dapper Puzzle Guardian I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Dresses yeah. very well. I guess if he looked like a bum, he'd probably get run out of town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would they would throw him in the uh, the horse's uh, water. Uh, yeah. You know, thing. And I think this so, is one of the few stories where um, somebody has a chance to open the puzzle box and they don't do it, right? And everything works out okay. Yeah, yeah. That you were mentioning this in the beginning uh, that that people usually in these stories they have a point that they could stop, and this is this is what happens. Like this guy, uh, he's uh, he's a cowboy. He's sitting in the saloon. This guy shows up. Hey, you want to play some cards? Uh, I can give you like this big treasure if you win, and uh, and yeah, it's a pretty intense game, yeah. and uh, and it goes through like uh, the duality of of everyone. Uh, like we all do good things, bad things, but bad it's the things, path that yeah. we want to take that that defines who we are. And uh, there's a form of judgment going on in this game, right? Yeah. And and it was interesting that the the, the real prize was that you don't get to you don't get this box. <laughs> yeah. When he wins the game, it's like you win. You you could you know you don't get the box now. Yeah, I know, yeah. And it's like, uh, and he was actually, you know, you expect a stereotypical response would have been, you know, that's not fair. Give me that. I, you know, that's what I want. Okay. He's like pretty much like that's okay. Yeah, but but he knew something was wrong. Uh, yeah. He knew that the whole town kind of did. Yeah, they kind of had the feeling that this guy wasn't human and something was wrong, and he was relieved when it was all over. Yeah, there's this uh, sense of foreboding evil yeah. um, as the game progresses and everybody gets progressively scared and feel like something significant is happening. And uh, and at the end, there's a big sense of relief and catharsis. And uh, even the guy, old Jed, <laughs> next set, next Sunday, he was singing in the church with the loudest of them. The he, like, was the, he was the loudest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, so a, that's, that's a great... It's like, 
kind of reminded me of High Plains Drifter, in a way. Is that... y'all, y'all seen that Clint Eastwood uh, film? No. Oh, okay. Where he kind of plays uh, the pale rider, comes oh. into a town to kind of, you know, rid it of, the, rid it of evil. Oh, that's that's kind of a... the way I... That sounds really awesome. I got to watch that. I have. I have to admit, I haven't seen that. No. You need to check it out. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. It's what does just what this uh, character with the box reminds me of? So I'm mm-hmm. kind of curious if the writer was inspired by uh, that movie in a way. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, it's also isn't isn't there like a a character in the Dark Tower? I'm not familiar with the Dark Tower, but isn't there like a character that is like a, this cowboy looking guy? Uh, do you, are you familiar with the Dark Tower? The, yeah, the Roland. Uh, yeah, the gunslinger. Roland? Yeah, the gunslinger. yeah, the gunslinger, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's a that's an interesting time to set, you know, a, an interesting set to put these stories in, like yeah, yeah, yeah a time because the that. Wild West really didn't have a moralistic kind of, you know, there were no yeah. morals during that time in some of these little small small boom towns. This reminds me of one of those towns where everything goes, and then they have something like this guy show up, and then they're like, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of pioneers and exploring and, and discovering new stuff that uh, that was hidden in the land, right? So yeah. uh, there was a lot of that going on. It was the frontier. I so yeah, exactly. I could just see the piano player stop playing when this guy walked in the door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you guess one of the funny things about westerns is that uh, someone always shoots the piano player uh, in the yeah. saloon when there's a shootout and the piano player is still playing the music, and then someone shoots him. Yeah, uh, or a liquor kind of bottle a gets shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so the next story is uh, uh, a really creepy one. It's called "The Warm Red," which is yeah. a great title. Um, one of my favorites. Yeah. And it has also a great talent uh, uh, artist doing it, and uh, and written by Jan Jan Strand. Bernie yeah. writes in, of course. Uh, Bernie writes in classic horror yeah, artist. I know. And, and and then Bill Ray and Michael Heisler. So yeah. I guess they did the colors and lettering. And that that his, that name's it's S T R N A D, so it's hard to pronounce. Strand. Yeah, I said. <laughs> yeah, it's probably Norwegian or something. Yeah. So yeah, this this is uh, this is another cool story. Uh, involves a lot of strange concepts and uh, uh, a lot of weird stuff going on in the backstory of these characters. But one of them is a, a, a real estate, I think, a real estate kind of lady. Yeah. She's interested in developing some property uh, that she gets a. Uh, she wants to turn it into something bigger than Orlando, bigger than you know. Yeah. Disney World, I guess. Um, so there's one guy who works for Disney. It, it's it's implied that he works for Disney because. Oh yeah, they say it, it says, a few times in not yeah. that right, but. He it, says, uh, "If someone knows I'm involved in this project, I might as well turn in my mouse ears." <laughs> yeah. I didn't pick up on that. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So the catch is, she wants to buy this property to develop into like this park slash hotel slash restaurant place. But there's one guy living in this one house in the middle of it, and uh, she has to go there and see if she can buy him off, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and and the house looks looks pretty derelict and abandoned. I mean, except for this guy lives there, but it's, you know, it seems like it's got broken windows. The walls are all cracked up, and doesn't seem to have any paint. Yeah. So she decides to stop by like and try Texas to. Texas Chainsaw Massacre house. Oh, yeah, that's a yeah, great... Well, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was like a house like that where it was on the middle of nowhere, and it just looked normal. I mean, there's nothing particularly... It doesn't look creepy or anything, but, you know, there's something off about it. Yeah. Being out in the middle of nowhere. Did you guys ever see pictures of what... Uh, what, uh, you know, that guy... That guy that uh, Leatherface is based on? Ed that, Gein. Uh, Ed Gein, yeah. You ever yeah, saw pictures... Like this. Yeah, pictures of the inside of his house... It's just yeah. nothing but like boxes and garbage, and everything is old and decrepit. And uh, yeah, so she goes in, and he at first is this kind of skittish guy, and uh, you can tell something's wrong with him. Yeah. And he has a lament configuration on the mantelpiece, and um, if things start getting weird, right? Yeah. 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 It almost she seems tries like to he, seduce he, him. He and it almost seems like he doesn't want. Um, he doesn't want to have to sacrifice her, but he's 
you know, the more she pushes, the more he's like, okay. I'm yeah, he's like sexually, sexually uh, intimidated by her, and um, she she catches up on this on this tension between them, and she kind of starts pushing the line a little bit. She she thinks maybe if he doesn't want money, maybe I can convince him, or I can you know wrap him around my finger, yeah, and make him do what I want. And it doesn't go well. It does not go well for her. Or so we think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so she's trying to use her charms, and uh, she's trying to promise him with money. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, she can sweeten the deal. But the thing is, he starts getting really, really, like, intimidated by this. And he, he tells her to leave, and you can tell that something's not right with this guy. And, um, yeah, so... He's kind of a Norman Bates kind of dude. Yeah. yeah. A very Norman Bates kind of, you know. And he uh -huh. had poisoned her, and then he tied her up, and... and um... And you find out that uh, he's working with a Cenobite. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, which is interesting. I mean, it's that that uh, that they would set this up, this up, up this thing where a person could, a person could be allowed to live and that you know live their life and just as long as you just keep on bringing us more people. Right. You have to wonder what happened here. How did this deal start? I mean, did he open the box once and and they said. Well, you know, uh, we can take you in or you can give us more people. And how does that work? It's it's strange because usually the Cenobites in the movies don't really care much for uh, deal making deal. except yeah. for Hellseeker where Kirsty says, wait, what if I make you a deal? Yeah. And in this case, I think it's it's because Face, uh, that's a Cenobite that shows up in the story. Yeah. And he shows up in a lot of different First comics throughout. And, yeah, especially and in the first four. They, they yeah. Call, and they call this, uh, in these first four comics, they call this the Face Trilogy. But yeah. but really, it's only the third one where we get his origin. And in, and in the, yeah. this first one, he just shows up with no explanation of, you know, why he is the way he is. Yeah. And I think that the reason why he takes this deal is because he wants... He sees, like, being summoned by the box as a way to get a little bit of respite from hell. He sees it as a way to like, okay, I guess this this gets me back into the human world, and I can enjoy myself without having to be at work, you know? Because yeah. he's he's tired of being at work in hell, uh, basically. Yeah. Like he's he's torturing a, a lost soul in hell, and he feels like, oh, looks like Michael, is it Michael, Brian, uh, Brian is is going to summon me. Oh, great! I'm going to have a break in uh, torturing people, so I can go there. And see someone else being tortured for my amusement, and uh, and and then of course she uh, she talks to Face and she tries to strike a deal, and she tells him that Brian uh, lives in the middle of nowhere. I'm sure he doesn't really bring you that many people, and I can bring you thousands of people. I can develop this land and find a way to give you all those souls. So, and of course that pleases Face. Well, and Brian's got a weird origin story too. Like he's his mother used to make him mother. lie down on the bed, and she would just slash him, cut with him up, straight razor. Yeah, yeah. I guess whenever he acted up, you know, sexually, or whenever she caught him like masturbating or something, and that's why he associates sex with uh, with torture, you know, with physical torture. Yeah, that's what I got out of this, at least. Yeah, and then that makes the sense. The grandmother looks like a very apple pie kind of, you know, grandmother, too, and she's yeah. holding this razor. Yeah. Kind of That's weird, strange. Horrible. A weird, strange thing, right? She looks yeah. like Aunt May from the Spider-Man yeah. comics. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was Except thinking. Except she's holding an open razor, yeah. 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 Isn't that also, like, what's behind um, the Tooth Fairy in that uh, in the, the Hannibal trilogy? You yes. know, you remember the exactly. Tooth Fairy? His, um, uh, grandmother. It was a grandmother, though, that would, he, if he ever felt any kind of sexual kind of pleasure or anything like that, she would, uh, I think she would beat him. She would, or yeah, like. she would she beat would, him. She would tell him she would cut his wiener off or something. Yeah, yeah something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, repressed sex urges are mess you up, man. They'll mess you up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Face. Face is a really cool uh, Cenobite, and he's going to show up in a lot of comics. And he's even going to show up in the uh, holiday special, I think. Oh. Right, if it's not the holiday special, it's the, um, it's the summer special. I think he shows up in a bunch of those. Um, yeah, I I think I've read that one, but it's been a while. Yeah, so, um, 
so yeah, so this woman actually tells him that she can uh, she can get more people, and so Face is like, well, okay, I guess uh, you can take Brian's place then. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. and he's like, wait, wait a minute, yeah, wait a minute, don't fair. listen to her, yeah. don't yeah. listen to her face. But he's like, but he needs proof that she's telling the truth. So at the end, yeah. she he ties Brian to the bed, and she and he gives it to her so she can torture him while he watches. This is also kind of an interesting. Um, Faces seems pretty different because people know his name. He seems to have the same personality that he had when he was human. Yeah. He's an actor chappy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was an actor chappy, just like yeah. um, Narcisse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, there's a few parallels with Narcisse and Face, actually, the once, once you start thinking about it. Right, that's true. They were both actors. They both don't have a face. Mm -hmm. Um well, the, of course, the Cabal one doesn't have a face, but yeah. the, the Nightbreed one does have a face. But, but yeah, so um, like you said, he does seem to be attached to his human persona a little more than most Cenobites. Yeah. Yeah. And I one thing that's, if that's really something that happens over, over time, they start to lose who they were, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, watching that miniseries of the pinhead comics it seems like there is some cenobites are more like entities that occupy bodies while others are just people who were taken and turned into cenobites yeah yeah well like even dr shenard right i mean he's not he doesn't act like the other cenobites he acts more no. like uh he, he just acts more like dr shenard the human only now he's you know got these yeah. godlike like powers and yeah just, you know, like this enhanced version of himself. Yeah. yeah. He keeps making doctor puns. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I recommend <laughs> amputation. Yeah. <laughs> I've made my diagnosis. I'm afraid it's terminal. It's a, once you start yeah. thinking about that, it's like yeah. Hellbound has such cheesy lines, but yeah. that's why we love it. That's yeah. why we love it. The doctor is in. Zen. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, cool. Yeah. Um, there's also these awesome pinups all throughout these comic books. And, yeah. um, yeah. And the Hellraiser anthology that Seraphin was putting out, um, was doing the same thing. And I think that was a great model that they were copying. Um, yeah. Cause it really adds to the experience instead of having ads throughout the entire magazine, you get these like nice pinups. Um, and which and is another thing that these, these books didn't have, they didn't have ads in them. So, that's a yeah. big difference right there. It's more like a graphic novel, you know, it, reading it through. It is, and, and it's interesting. They, they um, unlike other comics, which this was driving me crazy, but they don't put the month that they came out, only the year. So um, with a lot of internet digging, I was able to find out that the very first issue was in March of 1989, but I, can't, I couldn't figure out when these, you know, books two, three, and four came out. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there's databases online where you can find all yeah. that information now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and continuing this groundbreaking set of stories, uh, there's the Dance of the Fetus, one of my favorite stories. And I think, did this make it to those collected best anthologies that come yes, out? Yes, it did. It oh. did. Yeah. It's in the, I think, the third one. Uh huh. Of those, cool. Collected best. <laughs> those collected yeah. best books drive me crazy because you can't. They're all out of sequence, and, yes. and they just picked whichever ones they liked, and they're they're put in a random order. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. they're not put, and that's what I didn't like about them either. I think this series is due for like a, an omnibus version, yeah. like they were doing with the Nightbreed so. comics. Yeah. Uh, do you remember like the Nightbreed comics were being put out by? It was called the Nightbreed Archive, was yeah, it? Yeah, and, that, and Boom Boom did that, I think. And but uh, they only put out one volume so far right they had to put out the second one i'm not sure if it came out yet oh, i thought yeah it seemed like it was coming out really soon but that was a long time ago yeah yeah anyway so yeah the, this is overdue for like a new reprint of this but yeah. i think you can still find them on ebay so if you want to buy a set it shouldn't take you back too much well i think that i think that it was a mistake for boom to do them in that uh, collected best that they really should have just d collect them all I mean, they, yeah. aren't, they aren't all connected to each other, but there are threads that connect a lot of the stories. And I think it's I think it's important to have them all and in, in order. Do it like Pokemon. Got to get them all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you still play Pokemon Go, Ryan? No. 
Okay. No, it, it's, it starts taking up too much of your time. And once, uh, yeah. once, once Joey stopped kind of pushing us to do it, then uh -huh. we thought, okay, this is the opportunity. Now we can, we can stop. <laughs> yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the dance of the fetus is by Ted McKeever. Yeah. And I really love this guy's art. It's so, it's so amazing. It's so zany. And he's the um, artist and the, and the writer. Yeah. Yeah. And so what happens here is that there's a woman and she seems like her life has become nothing but routine and, you know, depressing routine at that. And she lives by herself and we don't know any of her backstory except that she's completely suicidal. Yeah. And, um, and she's waiting, she's waiting for a, a visit, a visitation, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I lo what I love about this one the most is that there's no description. It's just visual imagery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no kind of, you know, you just look at the images and the story tells itself. Then yeah. they start, you know, talking and stuff like that. But I liked how it, he really did that. Great Broke use of sequential, yeah, yeah, just sequential exactly. storytelling. Yeah. And this Cenobite uh, is really kind of impish and, and, uh, and uh, demonic, I guess. Yeah. You know, what you call it? It looks vivid. It reminds me of. Uh, oh gosh, <laughs> terrible. The Books of Blood story that about the little demon. Oh, the yattering. Yeah, the yattering. God. The yattering. You know yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To me, yeah. This this guy is pretty impish. He's he's like this big muscly kind of guy dressed in leather overalls, and. Um, yeah, he's he's very funny. Uh, he's got a lot of wit to him. He's very uh, impish in that way. He's like, she goes into her kitchen, is just sitting there on the counter uh, after he ate some of the chicken that she had left over, and he's like, "Oh, sorry, you know, I I was backed up. I couldn't I couldn't get to you sooner." <laughs> it's a very matter of fact introduction. Kind of yeah. Yeah, and she she was waiting for him. We never know how she summoned him or why. But, you know, here it is. So it really doesn't matter for the story. Yeah. I mean, it's – you pretty much get the gist of it, and she and they just talk a little bit. And uh, and I think she may have summoned him just through sheer will because it says here, I've run this exact scene in my head so many times. I thought I'd know how to react when the time came. And the demon says, well, after the 200th and 10th time, I knew you were serious. Are you still <laughs> feeling that way? And she says, Yes. And uh, and he says, "What was the last straw? What made you want to cash in?" She's like, "Don't know. Oh, no. Nothing specific." Nothing specific. Yeah. <laughs> it's typical. So what he does is he takes possession of her, and he's gonna he's gonna help her commit suicide and cross over to the other side. Um, but then when he goes in her, and I really like the way that he takes possession of her because basically he just uh, stretches out her mouth like a cartoon and just. Yeah. And just smokily goes into her body and just takes her over. And he finds something inside, right? She's pregnant. Yeah. Yep. So he's getting ready to to grab the the straight razor to slash her wrists. And he, he's just pulling and yanking inside her body, um, having a, a great time. And then he finds this little white thing. And uh, it's it's a fetus. Yeah, yeah, and and the the interesting thing here is like, oh, it, it it's it's kind of weird that he can just dive right into her body, right? But then also strange that you know he knew her so intimately, but he didn't, she didn't know, and he didn't know that she was pregnant. Right, and it makes you wonder if this has anything to do with why she's trying to kill herself. Maybe yeah. she's been abandoned. Maybe yeah. this was the, the fruit of some sort of violation. Maybe this yeah. was something that pushed her over the edge. I don't know. Maybe she just feels alone yeah. uh, and depressed. So but, he kind of releases this, this fetus and, and it floats up into the stars. Yeah, it's, it's great. And, uh, <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. When the Cenobite's asking the little fetus, uh, does she Get know her. about you? And she's like, who? And he kind of laughs. He's like, He's oh, my this. God. This is one of those things that happens at work, and you're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do about this? Yeah. And and then he's like, well, do you want to go? And he's like, go to where? He's like, to hell. <clears throat> and he's like, what's hell? Because he doesn't know anything. He's just a fetus. Yeah. He's yeah. The and uh, and he says, well, yeah, he can't stay. And the little yeah. fetus says, well, I'll go die someplace else. 
And he's like, no, we're not that cruel. And this is one of those moments where you see the Cenobites do have some sort of mercy or <clears throat> I, I'm, it's not just a matter of being against the rules. It's he actually says we're not that cruel. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he meant to some angels to others. So, like you said, he just uh, takes the little ghostly fetus out of her body and he says, go on, chew. You know, it, <laughs> yeah. I, it's like, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's not fair. But, hey, that's why they call it hell. And he just goes back and uh, his mom dies and he just looks up at the stars and floats away. So very inspiring. I thought this was great. A little tiny little story, but yeah. one of the best. I thought it was. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, at the end of this book, we have an afterword that's really just him kind of teasing the stories that are coming up. Um, yeah. Just to say, hey, you know, stick with us because more, there's more to come. But I don't know how long it was in between this issue because this was March of 89 and then the next one wasn't until 1990. So that's a long time, uh, you know, at least. Could, could have been months. six months or something like that, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Before they, issue two came out. Yeah. Um, they were just working hard to make it as best as they could, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of nice that they weren't, they didn't have deadlines and, and, uh, they had, didn't have to, you know, crunch to, to, uh, to get these books out in time and stuff. Right. Right. So the second book, let me see if I can find out when it came out. Um, yeah, 1990, but I have no idea what the month was. Yeah. Anyway, another great cover. Um, very Hellraisian, I would I would yeah. say. Yeah. Right. You yeah. got four yeah. chains stretching, holding up. Uh, uh, stretching a face. Yeah. And the face has a has a tattoo on the forehead of a puzzle box. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Just noticed that. Yeah. That's a great piece of art. I would I would give my left nut for that art. <laughs> yeah. I totally would. That's a great piece to have. Uh, on your wall. I wonder if I ever saw this being sold on eBay. I don't think I ever saw this, but it's, it's a heck of a piece. I'll tell you that it's a heck of a piece. I'm, I'm guessing that's also John Is Bolton. It, uh, it looks like it. I can't yeah. tell. Um, Oh, there's a the signature name. at the bottom. Let me see the fucking zoom in. So again, there's a uh, four uh, stories in here and uh, one, two, Three. There's more than four stories. Wow. So there's the vault, uh, divers' hands, winter's lament, writer's lament, writer's lament, and the threshold. <laughs> yeah, and the pleasures of deception. Yeah. So yeah, there's all sorts of like um, pinups here, um, front and end piece illustrations by John J. Muth. Uh, some pinups made by the great Bill Sankovich. Uh, page 34 illustration by Mike Mignola, which has the winky dink. It's the first time that uh, oh, yeah. that Cenobite appears, which some people call the yeah. clown. And the cover art is by Simon Bisley. You know, he did a lot of great covers for the Lobo comics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Simon Bisley's great. <clears throat> yeah. And one of these stories in this issue is written by Fangoria contributor Phil Nutman. Yeah. He wrote a lot of articles about Clive did, Barker. Uh, yeah, he did. He did a uh, lot of the. Did he not do the a lot of the work of uh, the articles for uh, Lord of Illusions when I that movie was being? I think so. Yeah, think that did. might be it. Yeah, the coverage for Fangoria. Yeah. Yeah. He did Wet Works. That comic book, Wet Wet Works, too. Oh, for Mimage. Yeah. Okay, I I think I read some of that, but I didn't really read the whole series. Uh, it's an interesting concept, I think. Was it the yeah. guy with the the guys with the armor that was like this exactly. golden armor that they would wear that would absorb the impacts of bullets and stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that was cool. So this one opens up with uh, the first story, um, The Vault, by Mark McLaurin, who was at the time uh, editing also. He also edited some of the uh, Nightbreed comics, I think. Right, Mark McLaurin? Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yes. And um, wait, what was the what was the guy that played uh, Ashbury? Oh, um, gosh. 
can't remember his name all I, that's okay. I've even met him and I have his autograph. And like, Wasn't he also called I'm McLaurin? Sure. I was just trying to figure no, out no, if I'm not. No. That's that's okay. messing me Got up it. now. I can't think of his real name. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't want to put you on the spot. Anyway, so the vault starts in South America, you know, a banana republic uh, scenario. And uh, there's a prisoner in a cell and he's got the box and he's trying to open the box and he's like mumbling freedom, freedom. And um, something happens and there's a big yell and that's when the story starts. In the darkness, he saw the light. So interesting because, of course, it has to do with some sort of revolutionary, you know. Spanish, this is during the Spanish Revolution. Um, <laughs> is that what it is? No, this is in South America. South America, okay. Yeah, this takes place in South America. It's one of those like Banana Republics that maybe it's entirely fictional. But uh, this general or something, he has this box, and there's one guy in a prison who solves the box and disappears, and he hates that because he doesn't want anybody to be able to escape that prison. And they get this big-time revolutionary guy there. He's kind of like looks a little bit like Che Guevara without the beard. And um, and they want to break him. They want to find a way to make him talk. So oh, and Ashbury you know, is Malcolm Smith. Malcolm yeah, Smith. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. So not Mark McLaurin. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So you guys want to take it from here? Uh, sorry, I was just oh. looking it up, <laughs> looking that up. Um, so well, it's set. Yeah, you know, the story's set in a, a prison, like you know. Right, That's what and, you, you and there's revolution happening all around them, and uh, there isn't. There's one revolutionary who uh, who was captured, and then and then they yeah. just captured Diaz, him. and he and the, there's a there's a puzzle box that he had, and everybody said the other revolutionaries seem to know that it's evil. They don't want to touch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and of course there's a there's a tagline that this uh, dictator uses, which is. Um, Restructuring must happen on all levels. No one is exempt from top to bottom, bottom to top, and middle from the middle out. Um, yeah. 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 So he keeps saying that all the time. And he's a guy who praises order a lot. And, uh, you know, again, this guy solved the box and disappeared from his cell. And he doesn't like that. He wants to know what happened. And so he's trying to break that revolutionary. And he gives him the box and tells him, you know, you have to solve it, and if you solve it, you'll be free. And he's been doing this with several prisoners, and, and when they can't do it um, or they don't want to, they get executed. Yeah. And there was a time when one of his, like, wardens says, you know, we can't keep doing this because, uh, you know, there's there's uh, Amnesty International, another, another company, another uh, – uh, and other institutions are starting to worry about our prison shooting so many prisoners and blah, blah, blah. Which, you know, of course, that 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 would happen, and um, and so the revolutionary, the guy called Diaz, um, he does not want to touch the box. He says it's it's evil. I'm not going to do it. He spits in the guy's face, yeah. and he uh, he wants you know he wants no part of that. And when he really shows that he's not going to break, then the guy just just the general cracks up and just starts hitting him with his. The cane, box. yeah, with his cane or the box or something, and in and in that beating up, uh, in the throes of his obsession, because the general is so obsessed with the box and he's just killing a guy with it, yeah. and the box just kind of fizzles into life and opens. <coughs> a cinnabite uh, comes yeah. out. Yeah, but this this art something is, strange. Is really, it's hard to uh, make out what's going on. Sometimes. Yeah, it is. Hmm. It's, it's, yeah, I agree. It's it's a little – it's very stylized. It looks yeah. like – not the thing that you're used to seeing in superhero comic books, maybe something you would see more in a, a newspaper strip. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like just two colors. Yeah, two-tone. Yeah. But he's gonna, uh, so mm. – But he's going to finally learn the – while these people disappeared from the top down, mm. from the bottom up. And from the middle, <laughs> which is what it seems like the people who saw this box end up getting sucked into it, like a like a genie lamp, yeah, and, uh, uh, or, or like revelations when Pinhead is stuck inside the box, right? Um, well, or they just and, disappeared like Frank, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so the Cenobite does does tell the general that hey, you know, you crossed over, so now you're going to be given another chance to uh, 
to regain grace. You lost your form there. You you killed that, tortured that guy to death, um, lost your cool, and we're going to have to reform you. So from the top down, from the bottom up, and from the middle out. <laughs> he's like, he says, no! Yeah. No! Yeah. He just know it. He's getting it bad. That yeah. big hook's going right up his ass or something like that. <laughs> Damn. <Yeah. laughs> uh, right. So not the strongest story in the issue for me. Yeah. Um, no. Not the not the strongest one. I mean, it's kind it's of really slow. Trippy. Had a bad kind of uh, pace to it. I didn't like the pace of the story. Yeah. The, and this next one, divers hands. I didn't really understand divers. What is that? <laughs> Did you guys understand the what that what that word in the title had to do with it? Hmm. This yeah. Now that one. you mention it, I don't really get why they call it divers hands. Um, yeah. But the, it, it's about a, a a man who contracted leprosy, and he's in a leper colony. He can't feel, you know, yeah. he can't feel the the box. He can't feel things. And he's this, in Carboro, Louisiana. Yeah. He's in a fictional place called the Carboro Hansen's Disease Center. Yeah. And this is going to play out in the end because you know there's going to be something interesting about it. But this caretaker, she's being introduced to the patients, and there is one guy who has no fingers, only, you know, kind of nubs. knucklish yeah. Yeah, nubs. nubs. And um, she gets interested in what's he holding, and the guy says, "I don't know. You'll have to ask him." So this is another kind of interesting one. This this character was so obsessed with this box that. When he contracted Hansen's disease or leprosy, um, he kept searching anyway instead of finding treatment. And so his while his body's rotting away, he's still obsessing over the box and trying to find it instead of helping himself. Yeah. Because he thought that instead of just arresting the disease, he could cure it entirely and, and, and revert it, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so he just keeps pushing forward. Um, and but, the- of course... Yeah. And there's also kind of a parallel to this nurse, right? Because she her job is to take care of all the patients, but she starts obsessing over him. Yeah. And uh, she's ignoring the other patients. She's starting to get in trouble with uh, her job. So there's she's this... falling in love with him. Yeah, it's not like she's really falling in love with him. Yeah, she falls in love with because him because there's a part in the book where she's making love with her. I guess her boyfriend or something. And she's really thinking of him. <laughs> just... Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. <laughs> And, and then she kind of, in her mind, she closes her eyes and she imagines she's making love to Vincent, who's yeah. the patient. And uh, so, yeah, so she wants to know more about the box. I think that's also like spurred not just by her interest in him as a person, but her interest in him and his obsession. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. she says, tell me about the box. I want to know. And he explains what happened and how he got to the condition that he's in. And, and uh and um, how he his obsession led him through the disease, and he thought that at some point he could just revert the disease entirely. And he found the Le Marchand cube finally, but at that point his fingers had fallen off, and he couldn't couldn't work the puzzle. So he needs someone to work the puzzle for him. And uh, she's skeptical, I think, right? Yeah, she's yeah. saying I don't believe this. Yeah, and he says that uh, if you open the you know, we'll get these angels, the Cenobites, and they can give me a new body. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But I think she's so curious about the box, and she's so fascinated with Vincent himself that she says, okay, well, you know, for for whatever's worth, I'll help you. Yeah. And this is another... <coughs> it seems like there's a lot of... Uh, there's there's a There are a few stories that, so far, that are um, where you have this agent of of Leviathan that he doesn't, doesn't want to do the dirty work themselves. So they, so they sort of get somebody else to open the box for them. Kind of like, uh, right. Chenard and Tiffany. Or the preceptor and judgment. Right. Right. That yeah. one. Yeah. But in this case, I think there's a good reason for that because he had leprosy. So his fingers fell off and, and he really cannot manipulate yeah. the box. That's true. He needs, uh, new, he needs yeah, yeah, hands, yeah. basically somebody else's hands. Yeah. So it's another first appearance of a Cenobite that will show up again in some other stories. His name is Hunger, and he's a, a pretty uh, striking character as well. Yeah, he's also in our um, Duels of Blood competition. Yeah. I, don't know I think you took the doing. image for Hunger I from the story. Doing, I think he's doing pretty good, yeah. Yeah. 
He's. Can you say he looks like he has like leather around his body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his skin looks. I remember like you saying that, Ryan. It's been replaced made by of leather. leather. Yeah. Yeah. He also kind of looks like he's from Mars Attacks. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. He really does. <laughs> <laughs> hunger is hunger is winning in the duels of blood against yeah. Cheddar too. He's oh, actually winning. Also, I thought that's what I read. Wow. Sounds like you're pretty coffee there, Ryan. Yeah. Are you doing okay? Yeah. Yeah. I just the uh, allergies. I hope you're not getting sick. Yeah, yeah I know. Allergies. So. In Alaska and Fairbanks, are the flowers starting to bloom now, or oh is God. spring no. coming? No, we still okay. have like four feet of snow. Out okay, <laughs> then how come you got sure. allergies? Well, uh, the weather. I don't when, know how. <clears throat> when the weather changes and warms up, it just happens. Wait, did you say you have four feet of snow? Yeah. Oh my God, dude! Wow. <laughs> That's that's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. The other day I checked out someone at the store, and they were from Alaska. And I was telling them, "Hey, I have a friend who lives in Fairbanks," and I keep teasing him about Arizona. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, "Yeah, I think she was from, I think she was from uh, what's the other big place around there in Alaska? Not not Anchorage. Not Fairbanks. Anchorage. She was from Anchorage. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. Um, so yeah, anyway, so hunger is doing very well against cheddar too. in the duels of blood. He's got 76% of the votes and he's ahead. He's got 183 votes against 58 for Chenard, uh, for cheddar too. I mean, wow. Wow. That's so good. Simon Bedford and Lori, if you're listening to this, you guys got to make your, uh, your fans vote more for cheddar too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although I can't blame, I can't blame people for liking hunger because hunger is very charismatic. Yeah, he's cool. He's very effusive. A lot of the comic book characters y'all you put up there for the Dolce Blood that you're doing good. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, so Vincent explains that uh, yeah, if I bring them people like you, then they'll they'll make me a Cenobite, and I won't I won't ever have to be sick or die. And um, so they torture the girl, uh, Mary, and um, while they're torturing, he says, "Hold on, I see something." And he kind of whispers at her, and she kind of drops the box, and the box falls into the, the, the ground as if it was water and disappears. And then the Cenobites disappear. And then Vincent is left alone, and he's like, where's my box? And, and the guy, then Hunger, before it disappears, says, it's nearby. Mm. And so he goes around, and he goes through rooms inside this uh, Carborough Hansen's disease center, and he looks around and he looks and looks and until he finds it, finds the box in a, a room by itself, an empty room. Yeah. yeah. And when he touches that's it, when yeah, they come back. Shows, yeah. And the, so the Cenobites show up again. And I think this is kind of a genius stroke because he says, I haven't called you. I haven't worked the puzzle. And then Hunger just points at the plaque on the wall. It says, Architect, Le Marchand. And that's when we, you get it. It's like, oh, no. The whole center of the Z Center was wow. a, a configuration of its own. And if you go through the rooms in a certain way, then you open it up and you, the Cenobites can come and take you. Yeah. And, and that's why he was searching for the box. He was actually solving this configuration. He was being directed by the Cenobites. So that was pretty that was, cool. Yeah, that was a cool ending. Yeah. This was, yeah. yeah. And, well, and he deserves what he gets. I mean, he obviously yeah. had no feeling for, for her. He didn't uh -huh. care when she gets, you know, torn apart. Yeah. And he doesn't seem to mind it either because at the end he's like, ah, oh, what fingers, what beautiful fingers. Mm. Right, because they bring yeah. back Mary. They turn yeah, her into so like he, a weird he was, uh, he was attracted to her too, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I think they, he enjoyed. They, they turn Mary into this uh, multi-limbed creature. And, um, yeah. And he spends the rest of eternity attached to this, the, to, to Mary, and she, her many limbs are always like touching him and like caressing him, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's very, very strange, very, very cool ending for the story. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Writer's lament. Writer's lament. This was a bizarre story, wasn't it? <laughs> it's really it's funny. funny. Yeah, it, it's it funny is, as hell. It, it is supposed to be like a humorous one, which you don't see that much, and it's a, it's a little jarring, you know. From up to now, they weren't like this. It's totally a meta story. It's yeah. it's a story about a guy writing in Hollywood, yeah. uh, and what happens to scripts and stuff like that. So at least that's what I got out of it. Yeah, yeah. 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 me definitely. too. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's about yeah. the, these people that give you notes and and uh, well, if you just only would do this, then it'll work great in this you know for this segment of the population or whatever. And 
Yeah, yeah. And 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 Max Wayne uh, is a freelance writer, and he finally wrote something that he considers his baby. And uh, of course, I'm going to guess it's a script. And he says, Max Wayne is the father to a miracle. And it says, well, now I got to take this to my editor. So yeah. he's going to take the little baby to the editor. Yeah, and the the um, they they really it's really really vaguely a Hellraiser story. I mean, he, they there's yeah. only a passing mention of how he got in hell in the first place, something about mm -hmm. solving a, a a puzzle, but they don't show anything or say anything about it. Um, yeah, he said he uh, until now his only accomplishment of any lasting value came the day he laboriously solved one particularly difficult and oddly seductive story problem. The problem once solved revealed itself as a lament configuration, a doorway, if you will, to hell. Yeah. So he's he's been he's now a freelance writer in hell. He yeah. used to live in Burbank, California. And now he <laughs> lives in hell. He'd be <laughs> hard pressed to tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's a, a, a her bank. That hard press yeah. to tell the difference is a running theme in this story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been to Burbank. That's where Dark Delicacies is. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's really like L.A. It's just it's all kind of mushed together. Uh huh. Uh huh. So he takes the baby over to his editor, and uh, and uh, all other people in the waiting room have babies too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. And so, yeah, and so basically what happens is he starts messing with his baby, he starts saying that, you know, oh, well, we're going to have to do some changes to the baby. And the changes are reflected in, like, physical changes to the baby. Yeah, yeah which is not easy to look at. I mean, I know it's supposed to be funny and everything, and this baby is not screaming or upset. But it's still, it's like he pulls his eyeball out and rips his arm off. And, <laughs> and that's then... uh, that's uh part where he says uh, this will have yeah. to go and he takes out the arm and he was like um bilateral symmetry was kind of one of my themes yeah <laughs> uh, and then he takes out the little wiener from the baby he's like yeah well we're we're people of the world so we don't think this is distasteful but you, you know but uh, other people might be criticizing us for this so we have to take it out and he yanks out the little baby's pee pee yes so, oh. Then finally, he gets and in the he, heart. He, yeah, he's like, "All right, I think I know a compromise that'll work for everybody." And he, you know, well, and you could, we'll put the eye and the and all the other stuff back. We'll just pull this out, and he rips the heart out. Takes the heart out of the work. Uh, yeah, and yeah. and the heart is actually like heart shaped. It's not like a it's not like yeah. a, a muscle heart. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, the baby was still alive when they were taking out those pieces. So it was still kind of like a living baby, even though it was maimed and mutilated. But at the end, when he puts all the eye back together and the, the arm and, and, and yeah. the little penis back and says, well, this will solve all my problems, just yeah. takes out the heart. Yeah. Which is, I guess, a, a kind of a way of, um, yeah. of, you know, drawing parallels with the way that sometimes oh, yeah. uh screw the work of a writer can get sold out and uh, they just say, well, you have to put more stuff. You have to put like more ethnic characters in here or you have to do, you know, you have to put some product placement in here and you have to have this character has to drink this beer and it has to be facing the camera and all that. And it's like, like David Lynch yeah. said once, uh, someone asked David Lynch what he thought about product placement at a, a festival. And his reply was very, very laconic. He said, Total fucking bullshit. <laughs> that was yeah. that was his opinion on product placement and yeah. uh, and its place in movies. And uh, that's that's David Lynch. So that's one from the master. Even though his characters spend a lot of time talking about pie and coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just but not, uh, just not branded pie and coffee. Right. And so the the editor tells Max, "Thanks for bringing your baby. You know this yeah. solves all my problems." Like you bastard, you killed my baby, yeah. and I hope you can do some more work for us sometime. It's oh okay, yeah, I got a bunch Good of idea. ideas. Yeah. He's already yeah. over it. Yeah, he's already yeah, over so it. He it's just not wants... like he really cares either. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of and a statement says, on how we hate this, but we all come crawling back anyway. Yeah. And he says, and from now on, Max won't put any hearts into babies in the first place. And uh, after a while, he'll be hard pressed to tell the difference. Oh. And it's kind of sad. Of, I'm reminded of uh, the Weinstein's with this guy, this editor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. some reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he so, just Harvey couldn't help but like tinkering with and screwing over movies and re-editing them and. Right. Yeah, right. it just was something he likes to do. The the whole power thing there. Yeah. Well, I mean, look what they did to the Bloodline uh, script, right? Hellraiser Bloodline. It was yeah. so 
so uh, changed and interfered with. And, and it, it started out as a baby, a nice script, yeah. something that you could actually enjoy if it was done right and had the right budget. Mm -hmm. And then it, the, the end product is just an Alan Smithy film. And it's so yeah. sad. You know, it's so sad. I mean, here, this is yeah. four years before that, right? They're, they don't realize that they're uh, predicting what was going to happen to Hellraiser in general. Right, right. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. that, that story is kind of just, you could say, is what happened to Hellraiser. Yeah. Yeah. To the That's true. Franchise, that is. Yeah. Very true. Very true. So that was totally a meta story, and, and I think it's great because I love the artwork. And the, this was done by the same guy who does martial law. And for some of the comic book re right. readers out there, I love martial law. He's such a great character. And uh, the art is by Kevin O'Neill, and the story is by Dwayne McDuffie. Um, but I think that Kevin O'Neill and Pat Mills uh, writing uh, martial law, they're like one of my favorite uh, comic book teams uh, in the world. So uh, the stuff that they came up with is just amazing with, with martial law. Are you familiar with martial law? I've only seen the Hellraiser Pinhead versus martial law when we talked about it on the podcast. I, I read right, that. right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. I, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any other experience with it. Martial law is this kind of crazy manic cop in uh, San Futuro Police Department. And it's like takes place in the future. And there's all these references uh, to, to superheroes from other companies. And uh, he's um, he hunts superheroes. And his tagline is, I hunt superheroes. I haven't found one yet. And he keeps <laughs> like bringing all these like superheroes in. And, you know, it's over the top. And he's got like barbed oh. wire on his arm. And his whole oh. outfit is like this bondage S&M like style uh, thing. He sticks like... Um, uh, what do you call those? He he sticks handcuffs through like perpetrators' noses and just takes them, and it's it's so amazing. It's so funny. He always he has. Like a, I'm looking at a picture. I've never heard of this, but he looks like a kind of a parody of Judge Dredd or something like that. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah, a bit like that. Yeah, yeah. Except he's not about the rule of the law. He just yeah, does yeah. What he wants. yeah. Just the look, the costume. Yeah, if you guys don't know martial law, get into him because he's really – it's such a fun comic book. He's totally, okay. a, uh, he's totally a fascist like character, but it's just done in such an over-the-top way that it's just completely like hilarious. I just love that okay. stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. And what's the next story? The Threshold. This, this was one of my favorites out of the series. Um, uh-huh. This is more of a – this, this was kind of like a David Cronenberg kind of story. Yeah, they, well, and the, this concept of this pain feedback loop, mm -hmm. that and the the way they explained it was like, wow, yeah. They, I think the explanation was that if you look in the mirror and you think you look ugly, and then you frown and you make yourself look more ugly, and then you think more you're more ugly, and and that was a that was a really interesting way to explain what they were doing to this poor guy. But I guess, yeah. you know, I'm kind of getting ahead here, but. So it's a dream that there's an institute in the future called Dreamweave. And uh, what they do is they provide you with experiences. And it's something that goes beyond virtual reality. It's something that you actually experience through your, in your brain. And they kind of connect your brain to a machine and, and, and you get these experiences, vivid experiences. Like, uh, and, like uh, in Total Recall. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or that other movie that has Christopher Walken. I forget the. I forget what movie, uh, the title of the movie, but there's one where you could record someone's experiences and then you could play them back to someone and they would be experiencing that as if they were there. Or even that that other movie um, with uh, Ralph Fiennes and Juliette Lewis. You know the one I'm talking about, Rob? Strange Days. Strange Days, yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah, that's a great movie. I love that movie. Yeah, that's a really so, good movie. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's something that always fascinated me, like in the future, if someone's going to be able to Play back someone's memories, you know. That'd make be, you yeah. feel like if you're a, a girl or something like that, taking a shower, they hey, you can record that. If you're a man, yeah. and you want to experience that. Yeah, or you can yeah. record uh, um, surfing in, in Hawaii or something, and you'd be experiencing that through the eyes of the person who did it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So in this case, yeah. So this guy is a technician. He's kind of a sadist. He's a giant sadist yeah. because he – he basically he just used this one guy who was a homeless guy, and he just uh, one day he um, he was trying to fine tune the the whole thing, right? He was trying to fine tune the mechanism that made these illusions, just in case sometimes there were glitches, and he was trying to find a way to get 
uh, fix those glitches. So he thought he could just experiment on homeless people. And, and, and he, he, <laughs> this guy was supposed to be surfing in his dream, but he was yeah. actually, actually surfing on lava. And they, they like left him there. They went, to, went home for the night or whatever. So the guy yeah, was surfing in lava was... and falling over and di- falling in and dying over and over and over again all night while they were sleeping or whatever. And they yeah. were like, I mean, he did, they did, he did some really nasty stuff to this guy. Yeah. And then, yeah, then, 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 then really... instead of like feeling bad about it, he's like, oh, I wonder what else I can do with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so kind of dark humor in a way. Yeah. His sadism starts getting the best of him, and he thinks, well, since the guy. Uh, fell prey to a glitch and we kind of fried his brain basically. So now we just use him to, I'll just use him as, um, an experimental guinea pig. And he just, uh, he's obsessed with pain and, uh, what happens when you reach a a certain threshold to the human brain. So he, (laughs) he's, he's done stuff to this guy, like make him like fuck a hornet's nest and, uh, Yeah, crush his balls, uh, drop him from the twin towers, uh, eaten alive by ants all of last week, and he's just going through this illusion in his mind, and it's terrible. And so yeah. basically, what he does is he's telling this one guy. So yeah, he explains. I just came up with the that feedback loop idea. You just start with a little pinprick, and then it just feeds up on itself, and it becomes this agonizing pain. And what's going to happen? After he crossed cross the threshold, he thinks he's going to make some sort of like Nobel Prize or something. Yeah. Um, Did, but that doesn't happen. Have you guys seen the show Altered Carbon? It's on uh, Netflix right now. No. I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard it's really they, good. They, it is really good. I, I watched it recently and I watched the whole series and they have virtual torture where they um, they can interrogate somebody in virtual reality so they can they can torture them and kill them over and over again until they get what they want. That's horrible. Yeah. yeah, that's really, really terrible. Um, yeah, I mean, and that the added factor of that is that you wouldn't be actually causing the physical body any harm. So yeah. you could just keep that state of torture going indefinitely as long as the mind is still there, right? Yeah, yeah. Really crazy. So in, so in this case, when he pushes the button to start the feedback loop of pain, that's when he actually solves the puzzle and the Cenobite appears, right? Yeah. Yes. Which Cenobite is this? I'm trying to remember. Is this Leo. One, one that we know. His name is Leo. Okay. We didn't include him in the uh, Duels of Blood. Yeah. Well, and I don't think he introduces himself here, right? And I, I, we might. He learn. does. Oh, he does? He says, yeah, he shows up and he says, Tom, isn't it? My name's Leo. Yeah. And he, he starts talking to him like uh, like he's talking to someone who, who earned a, uh, an award. He says, I'd like to offer my congratulations. I haven't expected anyone to solve this dream weave puzzle so quickly. And then he just uh, yeah. basically, yeah, he says, you're such a, an awesome sadist. You're going to you're going to just fit in perfectly in hell. Yeah. So Leo is OK. I mean, I think he's a little a uh, little nondescript for a Cenobite. He has, he has. I think he shows up in another story somewhere. I think he does appear in the background in another story, but he he didn't really become as known as Face. Right, right. Or Hunger. Or Abigor. Oh, yeah. Uh Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that was, that's interesting. I thought that was uh, some of the the really clever writing on these is is, uh, what kind of pulls me in sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the artwork is a big thing for me as well. Yeah. Um, this one is by Scott Hampton, and uh, Scott Hampton is one of my favorite artists. Was he was made he, a graphic? Mm. Was he the one that did the Jihad series? I can't remember. It looks it looks similar. No. Okay. No, he didn't do the Jihad series. No, but he did this wonderful graphic novel called The Upturned Stone, mm. and I really recommend that if you can find it. It was published originally in a heavy metal magazine. Mm. Oh. And uh, and it also came out on its own. And it came out shortly after these comic books, I think, like in the early 90s. So look Scott Hampton up. He also did Fusion, uh, Havoc and Wolverine's miniseries. It's really, really awesome. Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking about Kent Williams now. Yeah, that's Kent Williams. It's not Scott Hampton. Sorry. This artwork reminds me of the horror. The, what's the horror? How do you pronounce it? The horrors? Uh, the... Uh, That'll be introduced later that Clive wrote the horrors or whatever. It reminds me, did he do the artwork for that? Oh, oh the uh, Harrowers. The Harrowers, yeah. Uh, that was Alex yeah. Ross. 
Oh, Alex Ross did that? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. That's Alex Ross's artwork. Um, pretty amazing stuff in its own right as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alex Ross is a great, great artist. Um, so, yeah. It, so, basically, this is about a, a computer technician that's a super sadist, yeah. and he just likes to torture p- homeless people. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Ends well, up being and, taken and, to hell. And their business, you know, it starts out sounding like it's going to be this grand, you know, prize-winning thing that would advance technology. But what they end up just doing is setting people up so that they can have virtual sex with pretend celebrities. <laughs> that's, you know, that's yeah. what happens to the Internet, you yeah. know. Right, right. You create this tool and people are going to use – some people are going to use it for, like, interesting things like learn stuff and go yeah. and – Use it to communicate with people around the world. Others are just going to use it to uh, spread for, misinformation, yeah. uh, their own hedonistic uh, pleasures and stuff right. like that. So yeah, of right. course. Yeah, that was. Uh, it's really interesting because here we are in 1990. You know, they sort of uh, kind of ahead of the times yeah. with his story. Yeah, the internet didn't really exist yet, right? Right. No. Only, only as. Um, just, just, bulletin boards. Yeah, yeah, bulletin boards and and uh, dialing in through um, uh, like text searches and stuff through uh, universities. Yeah, I remember that. I remember ninety seven was when I got my first computer, so that's when the internet for me became like you know. You remember logging through Telnet? Yeah, Telnet yeah. students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I took like an app. Yeah. I actually figured out how to hack into University of Washington through Telnet so that I could uh, text chat with Jennifer when we were in different colleges. So I was at, you know, in Fairbanks and she was in uh, Washington State University. So I would dial into the university, my university, then I would Telnet over to um, to Washington University of Washington, and then That's I would cool. dial a, a redirect modem that would dial out to her her computer, and then we would text wow. with each other. That sounds pretty advanced for the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. yeah. yeah and that way and, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have to pay long distance phone bills. And we had IRC, and I think in America, you guys had the popular ICQ, right? Uh, yeah, later on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the next story is called "The Pleasures of Deception," and it's a pretty dark story, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's really creepy. Yeah, it really got under my skin. I was reading it at night. I don't know. It's really bothered me. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's it's very uh, it's very dark and depressing. This this artist is like a tortured artist, and he's uh, yeah, he's been he's been providing like some of his artwork to a gallery, but it seems like his work has fallen fallen behind a bit, and uh, it's not drawing as many customers as as it used to. He yeah. reminds me of the character from the Midnight 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 Meat Train. Uh, right, yeah, right. The movie adaptation. Yeah, mm-hmm. because he's uh, because he just wants to keep going further and further, and there's a point, you know, another point of no return. Yeah, yeah, with his in that case with his photography. This is the story written by Philip Nudman and art by Bill Kob. Um and so the main character in the story is a guy called Feldwebel. Yeah, and just uh, a crazy name. Yeah, yeah, and he's the kind of guy who just walks into the gallery. He's drinking straight out of a bottle, yeah. and he's bringing to the gallery manager uh, some of his new artwork. And uh, she's she's just saying, "Yeah, hey, I'm not feeling it. You know, yeah. you you got to find uh, you got got to find a new a new voice here because um, it's too dark. <laughs> People don't want to buy it." And she says, "Your alcoholism is dragging you in your work, and uh, you you got to you know." You got to stop living in the shadow, and uh, and so he's not happy with it. But at the same time, he's trying to find something that's going to take him to that next level. And he finds out this guy's selling uh, a lament configuration. Yeah, and and somehow he uses the influence of the Cenobites to create new art, which we've yeah. I think we'll see yeah. that later on in some other stories too. Yeah. So they want $5,000 for the box and he can't afford it. So he just breaks into the guy's house to take it. And he, he, he takes it to his studio, puts himself on the floor, cross-legged with a box and just, he he feels this, um, yeah, he he starts messing with the box. And of course the female Cenobite and Pinhead show up. And I do have this page here where he opens the box and, uh, the two pin, the two Cenobites appear. I have this page. Where he oh, says, really? "You summoned us. What do you desire? We taste your hunger." Yeah, I, I own this one. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's great. Um, and they basically 
take them apart, right? They take them apart and they give them a new vision. Yeah, so then he comes back out of it with making all these even more violent, you know, pictures, uh, paintings, but uh, people love them. Well, he's killing people. He's yeah, killing he's... people and bringing them to the Cenobites. He's become like a male kind of Julia oh. character, yeah. right? I think I, maybe I didn't understand that. I, I was kept falling asleep when I was reading this one. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, what what basically what the Cenobites say is that you provide the material and we you know, will guide your hand. Uh, yeah, exactly. I see. Yeah. So he brings back victims and then the Cenobites manipulate them and torture them and then he's painting while they're doing that and uh and his artwork becomes renovated right it becomes yeah, like yeah. this new vision and he goes back to the gallery and you know he goes back to the gallery and eventually he uh he discovers his new vision is taking over and he's actually not only painting his vision but he's actually seeing his vision all the time now yeah uh, which is kind of driving him crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this brings back that point that we've made before about this is this is one of those times where the Cenobites are cool with uh, killing innocent people. Right, right. Yeah. Which <laughs> yeah. is not it's most of the time isn't the case. I think they're not really in it for the souls of these people. They're just seeing these people as material, yeah. like material yeah. they can work on. Uh, as part of what what's happening to the the one who opened the box, as as part of his process. Yeah. So um, interesting thing here about the whole, you know, artistic vision and actually literally artistic vision, when the 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 artist uh, starts seeing the world through, I would you know through through a, a very different prism. Yeah. Um, it happens to him a little bit what happens to Harry the Moore in Lord of Illusions. Exactly. That's what I was thinking about when I was reading it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Want to see flesh through God's eyes, and then he sticks mm -hmm. his fingers in, and he sees everything is shit, and everything is, like, decaying, and all yeah. the flesh is, like, rotting, rotting in front of his, his eyes. And Which is probably the so way Leviathan sees the living world. Yeah, could be. So he just uh, he goes to the gallery. The gallery owner loves his new work, but she uh, she says, "Well, this is great, you know." And what are you on? <laughs> and uh, and he just starts seeing her and sees through her, sees the cancer in her cells and all that. He's like, "Oh no, this is not what I want." And you know, he he runs to his studio and he finds these homeless people on the way, and he he just sees the homeless person is all skinless and rotting, and it's like, ugh. So he yeah. wants to. To make it, it stop. Away, uh, make it stop. This, is, this yeah. is a very has a I like the style, the serialistic style of it. Mm -hmm. Goes into like a dolly kind of vibe to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so at the end, he goes back to his studio, and the Cenobites are there, and they meet him, and basically they turn him into a piece of artwork himself, and uh, he just becomes uh, trapped in his own art. And yeah. you see at the end the gallery owner. Showing up at the studio and just and asking him. for him, like, "Hey, where are you? Where are you?" Yeah. And that's him, right on the wall there. Yeah, right on there on the wall. Yeah. So that was one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy story. For sure. Yeah. And that's so the end, uh, of book two. end of book two. Yep. So, book three, also 1990, but I don't know what month. It seems like these were starting to get like three months apart, but between one and two, it's at least nine months. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, March they of were, 89 all the way up to 1990. They were struggling to find a, a way to put these books out more frequently. Yeah. Eventually they did, but uh, it didn't go very far. And book, so I, book two was the biggest, or actually book three has a really long story in it. But we'll get there. Um, I like the so cover there's Kevin O'Neill. Yeah, that's Kevin O'Neill art from the Writer's Lament. Um, that's a cool looking Cenobite. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if he's if he appears anywhere else with all those knives stuck in him. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw this guy appear again anywhere. But yeah. uh, that is a certainly a very appropriate piece of artwork for the cover of this issue. Yeah. And then uh, we got a couple of pinups. Um, 
Peter wonder. Atkins also wrote a story for this one. Yeah, yeah. Which Songs is really of cool. Metal and Flesh. Yeah, I liked it. And then there's 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 a pinup of a demon with like his his stomach is like a dog on a leash, and the leash is his intestines. Yes, this was made by A.C. Farley, and I have oh, wow. the the preliminary sketch that he did for this one. I oh, posted wow. about it before. I have the black and white ink sketch from which he decided to change a few things, like the the sketch that I have. The creature doesn't have like those uh, spider-like legs. It actually has two little legs, mm. like two little dog legs. Oh. And um, yeah, A.C. Farley, you should know him because he worked a lot on the turtles. Right. Yeah, that, that's where I recognize his name. Yeah, so he did a lot of work for the Turtles, and uh, he's on Facebook. I have him on my friend list, so oh, wow. shout out to A.C. Farley, because uh, yeah. he did a lot of awesome work with the Turtles. Yeah. So in our first um, our first story, and I guess I'll keep on saying this, but this one is bizarre. It's called The Crystal Precipice. And it, this is in the future, and they're on like an alien. These these characters are on an alien world, and this is a, the second story with the face character in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, this was again Jan Strand. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna say that name, and uh, Steve Bucciolato did the pencils, which is kind of old fashioned, but it works for me. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, like you said, the these are people on. Space, the final frontier. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> right. Yeah. So, where, where, so they, where they've arrived is sort of this dead world, and it, I think it's sort of like Leviathan's perfect place because there's no living things on it. Well, yeah, the, at least there's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's like the Star Trek thing. It's like those those crystalline uh, creatures are actually alive. They just they just don't know it yet, I guess. Yeah. They, they don't have, but flesh. They're, they're suspecting that they might be intelligent. Yeah. So this this is kind of reminds timey space exploration movies where yeah. it's like the people obviously aren't astronauts or they're not, you know, they act guns and they don't wear like space suits. Right, and they're where, just, uh, like, where space travel is more commonplace and anybody yeah. can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You, got, you got both men and women in the team and, you know, there's relationships between them and there's always the one guy who's a dick yeah. and he's going to get the whole expedition in trouble. And that's what Ernest. happens here. Yeah. yeah Ernest. <laughs> yeah, Ernest. Ernest fucks up. Um, uh, and I'm not talking about Jim Varney. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's who I thought about, though, every time I kept hearing that name was Ernest, you know, yeah. from those yeah. movies. Yeah. Ryan, you're a big Ernest fan, right? Yeah. Right. This keeps popping you. up. Love Ernest. So, um, it's a world that doesn't have any microbial life, so yeah. um, nothing really changes there because there's no metabolism cycles or anything. There's, If you leave something there, it's going to be there forever. It's not going to rot away. It's not going to decay. Um, so everything is held in this kind of dead stasis, except for those crystalline creatures who are just floating around. Yeah. But they do see at one point someone who looks like they got a face. And of course, they're looking at the Cenobites, who for some reason is inhabiting that world. So in this one, they don't really solve anything, right? There's no, no. There's no puzzle. This is just, they came up to this weird world. Yeah. And, and face kind of. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it, maybe you, you could argue that Ernest's uh, desire or Ernest's personality summons face in a way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's strange, but it's almost like he was there already, and this this world is kind of like Leviathan's world. Yeah, so obviously there's a guy who's like captain of the team, you know, captain of the football team. He's like blonde, he's like muscly, he's handsome, and then Ernest is the the ugly guy. He's a, he's got dark hair, he's yeah. ugly, and he's an he's an asshole. He's a dick. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's caught trying to to rape this woman inside their spaceship. I think he and of actually course, did rape her. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that was not that wasn't the first time that it happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Horrible. Right. Yeah, and, it is. And Barry, the the blonde guy, finds out and beats him up. And the the woman says, you know, feed him his balls. And so he <laughs> takes him out with a gun, and he says, oh, I'm not going to kill you. Um, you know, I, you know, I mean. Makes him run. Yeah, it makes him run for it. It's like, I'm not going to yeah. kill you, but you're going to have to run for it. You're off our expedition. So yeah. he kind of uh, chases him down with a gun shooting at his feet, and he runs away. Yeah. 
His life would have been a lot better if he had killed him. I mean, if yeah. they're abandoning him yeah. on this alien planet, it's the same thing anyway. Yeah, right. should just, they should have just shot him. And so they're trying to make their way to the crystalline city that yeah. they see out in the distance. And uh, un unbeknownst to them, Barry's also trying to make his way there, but he's meeting someone who's going to help him, and it's going to be Face. Yeah. And uh, Face asks him for a pound of flesh. Uh, if he can offer him a pound of his own flesh, then he'll give him you know, what he needs to get revenge, right? Yes. Yeah. And they kill the girl that, uh, uh, that, uh, Ernest was, uh, raping. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, of course uh, the, they find the corpse and it becomes like a horror. It becomes a bad sci-fi horror story yeah. where it's like, Oh no, it's, it's someone killed her. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there's like some, some desperation happens and then, and, and, you know, some drama. And then at the end, they uh, finally make it to the crystal precipice and they have no idea how they can get there because it's, it's, it's hard to reach. And uh, it's just, there's no walls. There's nothing. They just can't really seem to understand what they need to do. I mean, they got there, but there's nothing they can do. They can't communicate. They yeah. can't go anywhere. And uh, they, they look and they see him. They see Ernest, and he's on top of that structure, and he's, like, drinking waving water. Yeah. Yeah, like waving at him. Hey. And you can tell as time goes by that his face is becoming more and more skinless, right? He's, yeah. He's losing his face. Yeah, because he's been offering his, his flesh to face in exchange for what he needs. And, um, and so they decide, okay, so obviously he killed uh, our friend, and we're going to have to go there and get revenge. And uh, – and of course, you know Barry sneaks up on them while they're sleeping, and and uh, and and drama ensues. And yeah. someone pulls out a gun, and Ernest says, "I'm going to shoot this 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 woman." And she, instead of hitting her, he hits one of the crystalline creatures. Yeah. And that seems to uh, really piss off Face. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that the uh, in. Makes uh brings out some cinnabites and they turn uh Ernest into or they just what do they do to him here they just they turn him into a pet basically yeah a pet yeah pretty Said much you destroyed one of these perfect crystalline beings you know this was the embodiment of order and uh, you could have been you could have been one of those beings um, eventually just like your friends uh, you could stay in this planet and reach a new level of existence but now we're just gonna have to. It's like almost like a karma thing, right? It's yeah. like instead yeah. of moving up in the ladder, he's going to move down in the ladder. He's going to become less than an animal, like this. Yeah. This yeah. picture, um, like the yeah. beast from the beast, the chatter beast, or something yeah. from yeah. Bloodline. I think he becomes a pet to Butterball because that seems to be the Cenobite that uh, that he You're gets right. attached to. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think, uh, and then at the end, Face says, "Well, being a pet isn't so bad. A little painful during the reconstruction." And you'll never feel quite like your old self again. But we'll be close. It could be the beginning of a beautiful, beautiful friendship. friendship. Yeah. <laughs> Classic cliche. Now, like a Casablanca. This, this next one was, for me, a little tough to get through. It was super long. It's called um, Writer's... No, wait, what is this one? Uh, the Blood of a Poet. Yeah. The Blood of a Poet, it, it which seems, is the title of a movie. It seems like it was written like a short story, and then somebody kind of broke it up and made a comic out of it. I I like this one a lot. I did, um, I did too. It's um I think there are several stories out there that kind of drink from the same fountain as this. It's like it used to be a thing back in the early 21st century. Sometimes uh, patrons of the arts would pass on, but they would leave their their house or their property or their estate for struggling to artists. Yeah, struggling artists, right? Yeah. Like much like what happens in uh, Valerie on the stairs. Yeah, I was thinking about this the, that the whole time I was reading this. Right, because Valerie on the stairs is also about this house that um, the Heiberger house. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and and you know this struggling artist goes there and they can stay there as long as they're not published. Once you're published, you're out the door. Yeah, you're on your own. And the same happens here, um, Paris, 1925. This young guy. Um, you know, goes to Paris to try to make his fortune, and he goes to um, this this house, and um, 
Yeah, it's a great story. I have like seven pages of original art from the story. Oh, wow. Those oh, were the like first ones. Yeah, those were the first ones that I ever got uh, from eBay, early eBay, and the time when original art would still show up under the radar, and people weren't really that much into buying it. And so some of these pages I got really, really cheap, like uh, under 50 bucks. Wow. Um, I know. So I think at one point all the story, or most of it, was for sale on eBay in separate pages. Wow. And uh, I, I couldn't get all of it, so at the time I just got as many as I could. Yeah. And I still have them, and they're great. They're great little pages yeah. uh, by John Ridgway. Um, this is a super long story, so it would be tough to have all these pages anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, the he goes to the what was the name of the house? The Pension Venue. Yeah, yeah. The Pension Venue. And it's yeah. all pretty much told in first person from his perspective. Um, as he's, he's recounting. He's like recounting an event. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's already happened. Yeah, yes. And uh, he meets this butler called Sibo, and he meets the guy who's the the guy who was like the big shot mm -hmm. at the pension veneur. And you know, they take him to a little um, what do you call that? The the top room where you have a, a tiny room with a little bed, a little yeah. dresser. Yeah, and uh, he's like, okay, yeah, I can live here. But then at that night, he meets the people who live at the uh, pension, and they're all kind of these weird, weird eccentric, artists. Kind of just, you know, yeah, yeah, very, very eccentric people. And uh, and there's a weird climate. And um, and they have dinner at eight o'clock every night, and all this crazy stuff happens at dinner time, and nobody seems to think much of it. Like one yeah. guy, one guy will have a seizure and start foaming at the mouth, and his his face goes into his food, and they're all just ignoring it. Yeah, yeah, and then people are arguing and being just super rude to each other. Yeah. And that night, he he stays in his room and he starts writing, and he starts feeling like this weird trance state where he's like doing almost like automatic writing, and he's like having these weird visions, and he's putting them all on paper until his fingers start bleeding, and he yells, and then he wakes up. And it, yeah. he's not sure, was I really writing? Was I dreaming? Did I fall asleep at my desk? But then he looks at down at the paper, and there's blood on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. So this is so, another story of, of uh, uh, an artist being a muse, you know, getting his muse from the, from the Cenobites in hell. Right, right. And he discovers that one of the guys there, and they're all into this. They're all part of this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. They, this guy called Restif, he's uh, he's a guy who builds automatons and machines and weird things, and he's kind of like a crazy artistic engineer of sorts. He's and, inspired by Le Marchand. Yeah. Yes. And he yes. can't do as good of a job as Le Marchand, and people keep reminding him, and he gets really mad. Yeah. That's yeah. why he has those, like, seizures at the table mm -hmm. during supper. And I think he's at the library, and he, he kind of meets this girl that approaches him, and she wants to... Uh, to let him know that, uh, oh, that pension, you shouldn't be living there. That's really bad for you. That's a, that's a weird place that you should leave that place that people disappear there. Melanie? So, yeah. 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 And then at, at, there's a point in the story then when she warns him and he has a choice. He could, he could leave. He could move out. He but he decides. starts to like her. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And he likes her, right? He could, he could, um, he could have a life with her maybe. But instead, he runs away from her and goes back to the house. And, yeah, because he's... To try to stop him at first, is that's his um, in goal, to try to at least put an end to what they're doing. Yeah. Well, he's also fascinated by the output that the house seems to yeah. evoke in him. He, mm -hmm. so, he thinks he's going to be the world's best poet. Yeah, if he doesn't get crazy first... Um, and he's just taken by these visions, and every night he's writing, and his fingers are bleeding, and he's just taken into this this place where he, he's almost losing his mind. But he reads what he writes, and he likes it, and he thinks, oh, this is great stuff. So, yeah, but then he just starts knowing the other characters in the house more and more. They're really all corrupt, uh, depraved individuals. And, um, and you know, one of the guys says, well, Le Marchand can do it. Why can't I? He starts getting these snippets of things mm -hmm. here and there that— there's something going on uh, uh, that involves all of these people. And, um, and yeah, like you said. And then the next day, one of the guys dies, and uh, they come to pick up his body. 
And uh, everybody seems to be very nonchalantly glad that the guy's dead. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. weird that they, they and they all know that somebody, one of them, is going to be sacrificed every once in a while, but they stay anyway. Mm-hmm. I think they're caught in that in that uh, idea that you know the house is 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 producing this, uh, this output in them that they're that they're happy with, and that yeah. as a as a creator they feel like if they stay there, they'll eventually you know become big artists, but it, it doesn't really go that way. It does yeah. not. And like you said, even the girl that he falls in love with tries to to tell him to leave, but he just keeps going back, trying to stop them. And uh, he confronts them, but they take him as prisoner. And then he dis he discovers that one of the machines that Restif was working on is a machine that summons Cenobites. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you, him him going back and deciding that he wants to that he wants to um, he wants to explore, you know, his his new dark muse and and he kind of runs away from from uh was her name marion i think melanie melanie he was running away from melanie and she yeah. she ends up getting murdered right she gets knifed yeah right after. out of just a just a they say it's, yeah, it's a, a just mugging. a, a mugging just yeah, out of nowhere but we don't really yeah. you know we don't sure. really know for sure that that's the reason Right. Yeah. It feels like it's just another another a loss that happens to him to push him uh, over the into, edge. Yeah. Into yeah, over the edge. But what what we didn't go through is that when the Cenobites come, he um, it's another situation where he gets caught in the throes of this uh, verbal you know uh, babbling, and he just starts telling the Cenobites visions and poetry, and he starts reciting all that stuff that he has been writing on his study every night, mm -hmm. and they discover that he's really inspired and they're really impressed by what he's telling them uh he shows the cenobites how to transmute pain into beauty and then they turn on to barsak who's the the big shot that rules the house and they they determine that okay so what happened with the people living in the house is that they're stagnating they're not becoming interesting anymore they're just becoming tired they've fallen into routine with the ritual that they call the cenobites and they're fascinated by what by what the protagonist tells them. And they're like, you know what? We're going to make you the new head of this household. Yeah. Yeah, and we're exactly. going to take Barsak instead. Because he's an old guy, tired, stagnant. He's not really doing it for us anymore. So you're going to be the new guy. And then they take him. And the next morning he wakes up and the butler is like treating him like he's the master. And he's like, he runs away and he's like, oh no, I don't want to be this. I'm going to go out of this house. And unfortunately, when he goes to find Melanie, he discovers that she was, like you said, murdered. Yeah by a mugging and we don't really know if that's what happened well, or not and, but and the, the, her boss at the bookstore was the brother of the uh of the butler at this house yeah, yeah. suppose brother so yeah probably probably the uh the her, the boss killed her you know or for, the butler yeah. to make him come back to yeah. the uh, yeah and for trying to warn him away yeah so it's the mid-20s, and we end in this, like, note that Europe's, like, you know, political... Whoa, what was that? That's me. It's a sneeze. Okay. <laughs> Bless you. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it was 1925, and it was what was called the crazy years, and um, the political climate in Europe is becoming tense. <laughs> Stalin was become, would become the general secretary of the Communist Party. Uh, a young man called, uh, you know... Adolf Hitler had the year before started the Nazi party and things just seem like they're moving towards this weird place. And so eventually he, he gives up and he <laughs> moves into the pension veneur and he takes his role and he's like, okay, I'll do it. He surrenders to it. Um, he's defeated. He's going to be, he's going to take Barsak's place and, uh, and he's going to keep on feeding people to the Cenobites in an attempt to get more visions and become a well-known author. Yeah. What's well, cool about what I noticed in this one, I don't know if Scott, Scott Derrickson got the idea from it, but there's a one, one of the pictures. I was just where, going to uh, talk about that, too, of, of, it of totally it looks the, like, the Cenobites there. It looks like the chatter, uh, the half chatter there. You know what do you call it from? Uh, yeah, there, there's torso. a from there's, Inferno. There's a chatter. Torso, on, yeah. On his hands and knees there. Like, yeah. 
torso. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, yeah, Rob, you're saying that you, you're you wondering if Scott Derrickson got, yeah, got the idea for torso. Got the, that's kind of... For, yeah, the page where... Um, the page where a restive's machine opens up a hole in the basement and then they'd come in and you see, yes, you see that there's a cheddar like beast there. That's well, a very interesting uh, find. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at that hell, and yeah. I was wondering. And Clive Barker's original idea for the cat chatterer was that he would kind of jump around like a monkey. Uh, but then the reality of the costumes and stuff made it impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that takes me to my favorite story in this issue. Yeah. Which is Songs of Metal and Flesh. Yeah, my it was mine too. Yeah. That was written by Peter Atkins. Peter Atkins. And here they actually misplaced uh, they mis misspelled his name in the oh, yeah, title. It's, just, it's his Akins on there. They took the <laughs> yeah. oh, <that's> the <laughs> I know. Wow. They they forgot the T. I've seen that. pages of this story show up on eBay, but they were too expensive. Mm. Um they were too expensive. They were like three thousand dollars a piece. Oh wow! But it's a great story. You can find the script that Peter Atkins wrote for this story. I think I can the probably Hellbound get it. Web. Yeah. yeah, in the Hellbound Web. Sure, we can add a link to that in the show notes. So basically, it's about this little boy, right? He's born blind, so um, he ends up getting all his other senses more uh, fine-tuned, and so he's really into music. And he creates all these, uh, you know, he's really becomes a master of the piano. Yeah, he's a prodigy. Yeah. Uh, becomes a master pianist, and he falls in love with a woman, and, you know, he, he, you know, gets... Creates, you know, symphonies. I mean, he's using the notes and stuff like that are becoming like a puzzle to him. Right. And there's another guy who's his competitor, I guess, at the Academy. His name... Stephen, and he's also a he's, he's he's a handsome guy. He's a great pianist as well, but he has to work a lot to become as good as Jason. Uh, he says, "Well, you, Jason, you're different from the rest of us because you make it sound natural and easy." Yeah, he's and, like Salieri in uh, in Amadeus. Yeah, Mozart. Um, and so Stephen ends up stealing his girlfriend first, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and right in front of him because they think because he's blind that he doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, but he can hear everything. Other senses, yeah, are so yeah. heightened. Yeah, he can smell what they're doing. He can sense the rustling of the dress against his jacket and stuff like that. So he knows that they're cheating on him. But he's like, well, you know, I'm okay with it. We'll see where this goes. And one night he um, decides to try some kink with his girlfriend, and she takes out a knife and she kind of like knife plays with him a while and he was like oh yeah that was that was it that was what i needed uh you know this gave me the clues to the hidden sonatas mix yeah. of pain pleasure and secret agendas was the closest i ever got to it yeah and um and then while she's what, tying him up he's uh, her uh steve is is breaking into his apartment he's booby trapping his piano yeah and he put uh um straight razors in between oh, every single key yeah. of his piano yeah. And so after after sex, he was feeling inspired. He decides to go to the piano and decides to start playing. And for some reason, he, he goes to do this glissando on the keyboard and he starts and he ends up cutting all his fingers to ribbons. Yeah. yeah. He slides yeah. his hand across instead of just pushing one key or whatever. But yeah. Unfortunately. So he ends up in a hospital. His career is gone. Um, and he kind of shuts down. He kind of shuts down for a while, right? Yeah. yeah, but he and but then he keeps uh, he keeps writing. He keeps writing, keeps working on the puzzle to the hidden sonatas that were in his head, and he's like, you know what, that was that was a good thing because they kind of took me off the piano and got me into, gave me more time to, to uh, to to research, right? And that's when yeah. he starts chasing the rabbit down the hole. And if he'd become a famous concert pianist like Steve, then that would have just distracted him from his great work that he's doing. Yeah, he'd be distracted with the glamour and the tours and the recordings. And it, yeah. it, it gave him a chance to work long hours and started looking into this Parisian lunatic's work, yeah. Gerard the Nerval, a poet, a poet who took lobsters for walks and hung himself <laughs> with an apron. Yeah. That's true. He did. He uh, did. He did. Uh, they act, I actually looked up. I never heard of this guy yeah. until you know. You actually, uh, yeah, I did. They uh, he hung himself and with he his hat with his hat still on. 
Well, geez. well, you gotta you gotta look good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so he starts getting uh, he solves it one night when he's like composing and he um, he kind of solves it and he gets this influence from the Cenobites. He starts like almost breaking through the the wall, right? He gets this. Uh, he gets this influence from the Cenobites. They're just over the edge, like kind of waiting to see what he's going to do. And then he does something really amazing. He um, he puts like all these these uh, music pages on the floor, and he just uh, hammers nails to a, a door, right? And he rolls himself over it, and then he just spins around, and wherever the blood drops would fall, he would connect them and make the music. Wow. Yeah, that's that is amazing. Which is an amazing vi visual for a Hellraiser story. Yeah. Um, and he uh, he one day decides that uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna you know premiere this piece that I created. Like he was still a big composer, and he's still kind of like people remember him as a prodigy. So he gets Stephen, his competitor, to actually play that for him, and. Uh, he, he told people, you know, here's my composition. It's going to be a secret until you play it. And it wasn't rehearsed. And so the big, big day comes and everybody goes into the, the concert hall and Steven starts playing it. And holy moly, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. right. And uh, Steven gets it the worst. Yeah. Yeah. There's an ultimate. He was really just doing the ultimate kind of revenge. Yeah. Oh. You know? Yeah, he's kind of sitting there quietly in the audience and nothing's happening to him while everybody else around him is getting, you know, hooked and splayed and stuff. Basically, the whole concert hall goes to hell and the Cenobites yeah. take everyone who's in it, including Jason yeah. and Steven. And uh, they just turn it into this this um, crazy concert that goes on forever with uh, torturing the souls of the damned. Unfortunately... Here's the kicker at the end, which is really amazing. They kind of flipped everything on its head. So they gave him back vision. His sight, yeah. yeah. And but then that's all the only that's all he has. So he can't hear. Yeah. Or, so yeah. He, he loses or... all of his other senses. So he can only watch the performance and he can't actually uh, hear it. He can't actually hear the piece that he wrote. And uh, that's like the Beethoven kind of like, you know. Yeah. Thing. Well, mo yeah, Beethoven which was deaf, right? Yeah, he couldn't hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the the end splash is just this amazing, like crazy concert with Leviathan ruling over it, and you see people playing these like instruments made out of body parts. One guy's playing his own spinal cord, and yeah. um, the Stephen has been turned into this kind of double harp thing, yeah. where uh, a demon is hammering on his uh, rib cage while other guys are playing the harp made out of his limbs and yeah. and it's amazing it's just an amazing visual this is like this may have dave. been the, the craziest thing i've ever seen in a comic book yeah dave dorman dave dorman did the artwork for this it's really good yeah. artist yeah this is what hellraiser visuals should be like this is what we needed in the movies unfortunately we never got anything that was up to this level yeah does that demon have a name, or does he ever come back again? The one without a mouth there and the barbed wire around his shoulders? Yeah, I don't I think ask, so. I'll have to ask Peter what he, maybe he named him or if he yeah. might. Well, yeah. in the script, he doesn't have a name, but oh, uh, yeah. yeah. The other Cenobites do have names, though, in the script, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So fantastic artwork. Really, truly, like, groundbreaking visuals for this one. It's This is what Hellraiser should have been like in the movies for me. Yeah, this, Again, one's, no. this one is amazing. Not a surprise because it's Peter Radkins, and Peter Radkins yeah. is like yeah, an yeah. integral part of the Hellraiser mythology. So thanks, Peter, for this wonderful story, the Songs of Metal and Flesh. You know, it's funny that they've made ten Hellraiser movies and not one of them have even thought of using a comic book story as a, a, a movie premise. And there's so much out there. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree. This this could have been turned into like a treatment, and they could have made like a whole script out of it. Yeah, I think it would have been great. A ninety minute movie for sure. Um, there could be a, a few other things added to the story, but a ninety minute movie of songs of metal of flesh that would have been amazing. Yeah, it could be called Hellraiser colon songs of metal and flesh. <laughs> yeah, but, but no, no, we have to yeah. get things like Hellseeker and. 
Revelations in Hell World. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next one, uh, last issue we're going to talk about today, number four, right? Yeah. It has a story by Nicholas Vince. Yeah. That was cool. It was nice to see uh, Nicholas Vince's inaugural Cinebite. Hellraiser story. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote this story, and artist John Van Fleet illustrated it. Um, so, yeah. And uh, it's mentioned here that John Van, uh, John Van Fleet was preparing a Hellraiser Nightbreed crossover to be published in the near future, which I think was Jihad, right? Yes. Yeah. So that was, that was his uh, artwork there. And so here we go. Um, it's called Cenobite with an exclamation point. Yeah, and it starts with a guy crossing through the threshold. He just solved the box. Uh, he killed his wife or girlfriend, and he's just walking over into the labyrinth. And uh, and it's yeah, and he's he, and he sees Leviathan. And he he wa he wanted to go to hell because he wanted chaos. Yeah, he, he was tired of order and he wanted chaos. And they're like, uh, no, that's we do order here. We're not chaos. <laughs> Uh, it's, his name is Edward Leverett, and he walks into the maze, and it happens to him something that happens to Shannard, right? Like Leviathan glows his black light upon him, yeah. Yeah. and we get this character's backstory. And he grew up in a nun college, uh, and uh, the nuns incult, you, know, you know, put order into his mind, um, and uh, that's what kind of made him become a attracted to chaos. He wanted to rebel against that order. And, um, you know, and they made him torture other little kids. You know, they made him say, oh, this little boy here, it's going to be assigned to you. And this little boy shit is sheets. So you're going to have to teach him not to do it again. Yeah. And basically what he does is just he tortures that little kid. He, he calls him a, a dirty, little dirty, filthy, yeah. Dirt, yeah, dirty, filthy deserter. Yeah, no, something like yeah. that. Yeah, so um, it's not a it's not a good college. It's not a good school. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, this dirty school ran by petty-minded, narrow-minded yeah. nuns, and you know he's not really getting much of an education. He's just being taught how to repress other kids and uh, and and torture them a little bit, em yeah. emotional and and and. Uh, he pours bleach on one on the on the uh, deserter. Yeah, and he also uh, shines back onto his time in the army, right? Yeah. And and they say that one of members of your uh, squad ran away, so you got to maintain discipline. So he ended up torturing him, made the guy drink bleach, and yeah. kicked him and tortured him. So it seems like he's been put in this situation where every time he was a member of some sort of institution, he he was pushed into enforcing order in his own special way. Yeah. And his special way is just torturing people. And uh, that's why he he just wanted to let chaos rule as a way to destroy all these institutions that he was a part of uh, as a form of rebellion. But that's not what happens. And so at the end, he just kind of conforms to it. Right? Yeah. And it, it seems like this is kind of the beginning of where we start to see the Hellraiser comics go, you know, saying that they're all about order. And like in the Jihad yeah. series, the Nightbreed represented chaos, and and the and Leviathan represented order. He's a he's a very strange character in the sense that he's incapable of connecting to anything. It's like he's been taught to repress himself so much that he's just obsessive about everything. He's just obsessed yeah. about order, and he's obsessed about how to destroy this order and, and let chaos rule. He says that order betrayed him. He says that order, all it did was make his life bad. And, yeah. you know, and every time he did what he was told, he was following orders and then he still got punished over it, it because kind of makes you wonder how this woman fell in love with him or, you know, I know he's, <laughs> he's a really messed yeah. up person. Yeah. Um, so he ends up meeting this Cenobite who's like, uh, stretched out weird face Cenobite, right? I think yeah. he shows up again in another story in the background, but we don't get a name for him, do we? I don't no, so. I never got one. Yeah. So after all this flashback and all, all this transformation that happens to him in the labyrinth, he meets the Cenobite and he basically tells him, okay, from now on, you're going to be a Cenobite. Yeah. 
And he's like, oh, well, but I thought chaos was going to rule. And they were like, it was a lie just to trap you in. And yeah. <laughs> you're going to be a member of the war on flesh and uh, you will not question. You will obey. And he says, well, finally, I have a commander, a master. At last, I am a slave. So he kind of falls into it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Was this character an artist? I'm trying to remember. It's like he was supposed to show up for something with his girlfriend or wife. Like yeah, at a gallery. A gallery opening. Yeah. And he, so he's some kind of another struggling artist. Which is, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of those characters in the Hellraiser comics. Mm-hmm. So we have more more interesting uh, pinups. Some of them yeah. are Hellraiser related. Others just seem to be random stuff that yeah. uh, people just made. Um, and you have the second story, like flies uh, again for wanton boys. Yeah, like flies to wanton boys, uh, painted by Scott Hampton again, uh, in memory of Bernie Krigstein. So this again, it's it's from the same guy who painted the story uh, about the Dreamweaver Cube and. Uh, and written by Bunny Hampton Mac. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that's a wild name. Yeah. Bunny Mac. <laughs> that's the yeah. funny name. So Scott Hampton, he's a, a master of illustration here right? because look at the sets and look at the dresses and look at yeah. all the stuff that he does. And yeah. he fills the, the pages with so much detail, yeah. which is truly amazing. Like there's – it's painted art and you see this one dressing room or, or – uh, room where people are meeting for a salon and he also made paintings for the walls in this painting so you see little paintings on the walls that he made illustrations there so that's that's amazing detail and it's a story about this one man who is um there's a story there's a story that happens to this guy and there was an explanation of why this guy didn't leave his house for seven years yeah yeah, it, it it's an it's a really interesting story because it's not like it's not like other Hellraiser stories that we've read or seen so far. Right, there are no Cenobites in this story. Yeah, yeah, he um he he's a guy that liked puzzles, kind of like Tiffany, I guess. And he, you know, unknowingly opened a puzzle that was it was red though. I mean, it looks kind of like the puzzle box, but it comes apart. He solved it, and then he goes upstairs, mm -hmm. and he gets trapped in this sort of a hell of, of uh, walking, you know, walking to a door, and he opens it, and then he's he's, he's in Keeps. a dark room, and then the next door yeah. is even farther away. Farther, yeah. yeah. And so he's in there for days, just walking to doors over and over and over and over. Which is a very original idea for hell. Um, yeah. So it's just testing his resolve. Every time he opens a door, the next one is further away. And he, at last he opens one door and he can't see where the next door is. And he's just like, he doesn't know what to do. It's like, do, do I go? So he eventually he almost went to the limit of his strength. And then ultimately he found the other door. And, and it, uh, it was locked. And it was locked. <laughs> yeah, <God. laughs> and, but he did it. He but he made it. For like a day. Yeah, but he made it. He uh, he f he crumbles to the floor, and then when when someone is walking in that house, they they see his body on a on a hallway, and they take him back to his house. And from that day on, he was always afraid to go into locked rooms, and so he yeah. never really left his house. He didn't allow any doors to be locked inside his house, and he uh, his wife kind of starts getting really upset about it. It's like she's like, I don't know what happened to my husband. And he's just isolated from the outside world. And she kind of feels like, you know, we were social people and now we're just staying here. Yeah. And then ultimately he <clears throat> decides that he's going to leave the house. He, he decides. He, years, yeah. Yeah. He says, well, as long as you're with me, um, we, we uh, it, it's not as frightening. So I think I'm ready to take the step and, and walk out. It almost seems but, like the moral of the story is like if you get uppity and you think you, you know, you think you can, you know, go out and do the stuff and have a normal life, we'll, we'll hit, hammer you back down. Right. Yeah. But the price hadn't been paid yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, he didn't know that. But when he solved the box at that party, he was put through this kind of uh, trial, but nobody was taken, right? Nobody yeah. was taken. He came back. 
and he thought everything was okay, but it wasn't. There was a price to pay, and the price is that that night before he goes uh, outside of the house, he wakes up to his wife choking in bed on something, and he doesn't yeah. know what's gonna ha- what's happening, and and he has to get out of his house to get help, and um, he's unable to to step through the threshold. And ultimately, his his wife coughs out something, and it looks like a tiny little diamond, like a little Leviathan diamond. Yeah. And um, and yeah, and so yeah, and so he 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 wants to save his wife, but he can't. And um, he does climb out of the window of his house, I think. Yes. Yeah, he gets the doctor. Yeah, he gets the doctor, but once he gets there. Um, he he sees his wife uh, running towards him, and he goes through a threshold of the door, and and his wife goes through the door as well. And instead of meeting each other, his wife kind of disappears over the threshold, into the and dark, then it yeah. into the dark. And then it's shown to us that his wife falls into the same hell that he came out of. Yeah, and she is alone in the darkness, and there is no doors around. And so the that was it. It's like. And that the doctor forever in darkness. That was yeah. So hell takes his victim, and it's his wife, and uh, he just stays there. And everybody's like, "Oh my God, it was true. She disappeared when she crossed the threshold of the door, and uh, they took away the thing that he loved the most. That was the price he had to pay for opening the box." Yeah. Yeah, kind of a sad one. I mean, and this, yeah, that was this, this is another case of a, a person who didn't really know what they were doing when they opened the box. Somebody just handed it to him at a party. Yep, yep. And uh, he didn't know there was a price to pay. Mm -mm. But it seems like in the movies they're a little more lenient towards people who open the box in ignorance, like Kirstie does. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it depends. Because, like, in in the most recent one, in Judgment, didn't the wife got, uh, or the, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the killer's wife got dragged out of the hallway. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so did the brother. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Um, so the next story is the origin story of Face the Cenobite, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So finally we've we've seen him twice and, and we get a sense that this is an you know, this character is gonna be recurring and now we get his origin. Yeah. Which like you were saying before is kind of like Narcisse. An actor chappy. Yeah. Again, the story by Jan Strand, or Stranad, I don't know how to pronounce this, I'm sorry. Yeah. An art by Mike Chiarello. Um, really great stuff here. And um, yeah, he's, we start by uh, showing this. He looks like a silent, silent movie actor. Yeah. Um, he's yeah. about to play Oliver Twist. He's trying to... Uh, I think this character is based uh, on uh, the man of a thousand faces, Lon Chaney. Yeah. Him. Um, yeah, they even have a picture of Lon Chaney in here. Yeah, so, so the that clown. that clown that keeps on like holding his finger up to to you know to say shush is that a Cenobite? No, that's that's, well, Lon, that's Chaney. Lon Chaney from a yeah. movie he did. Yeah, so this guy is famous for uh, doing his own makeup and 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 uh, changing himself to uh, feature different roles and is like he's about to to do a. a Fagin, um, Mm -hmm. or the guy who's, is he the guy who has all these street urchins like steal for him in Oliver Twist? Yeah, I think that's who it is. I think that's the guy, right? So he's trying to come up with uh, the proper makeup to play that character, but he's having trouble finding, uh, the, 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 the best embodiment of the character until he's walking around, uh, and he finds this bum that crosses his uh, his way, and he's like, "Oh, that's it! That's the face that I need. That's the face of uh, F- Fagin or well, Fagan." And, or and at how- every at every pivotal moment when he's gonna do something that he shouldn't, you know, then then you see this picture of Lon Chaney, you know, in the clown makeup. Yeah, it seems yeah. like it's that's that's sort of signifying something, or that's important somehow. Right, but he chases this guy down and. Uh, he chases him down to the store of Hollywood mannequins and he goes in there. I think all he wanted to do was just talk to the guy and maybe sketch him or maybe try to find a way to take a picture of him so that he could reproduce his face. But what happens is he goes in there and he discovers someone killed that guy and took his face yeah. and ripped the face out like a mask. 
and he, he's he's horrified. He's like, no, damn you, how did you do this? You know, I needed this face. And then he looks, and there's a mannequin holding a face in its fingers. Yeah. And it's the face that was surgically taken out of the bum. And, and he picks it up, and he looks at it, and it looks like a mask. And he just applies it to his own face, and he feels the warmth of it. And he thinks, I'm saved. And so basically what he does is he starts using other people's faces as a makeup thing, right? As a mask, which is kind of a crazy idea, but it, you know, but it works and he, uh, he uses it and he plays the role and everybody's crazy about it. It's like, how did he do that? How did he change his face? So, um, yeah, but of course, you know, the police is looking for the killer. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then he's, he, he travels to England to get another face for another another character, yeah, uh, and then um, eventually he gets caught. Yeah, he wanted to find Quasimodo, right? He wanted to find a face to play Quasimodo, in the you know the 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 hunchback of hunchback Notre of Notre Dame. Yeah. yeah. So he he goes to England and he's looking at the circus and he's uh, he's like checking it out and he finds out that there's this freak um you know i I mean freak but i mean it not not as an insult but like you know back when the circuses used to have carnies uh, carnies yeah like like they would have the freak tent where you go and see the man who like eats with his feet and stuff and obviously uh early form of horrible exploitation like these people weren't being able to have a normal life they were just you know, freaks to be gawked at, which of course is terrible. But he sees this one, uh, one freak who's been washed by his mother, and I think he's supposed to be this this guy with no limbs. Mm-hmm. And uh, and at the time when the mom is like bathing him, and she goes out into the trailer, he goes and kills him. Yeah, drowns him, uh, drowns him in a bathtub, and uh, runs away. And so the the circus buries that guy the next day, and he goes back and digs him up and takes his face. And he's like, he found his Quasimodo. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, the mother of the guy he killed went to see the movie, yeah. and she recognizes the face as being her son, Henrik. Yes. So, and of course, he has to do some explanation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah really crazy. And, yeah. And that's what gets the cops on him, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's what gets the cops yeah. on him yeah. a bit, and um, and then the next thing he wants to he wants to do the Phantom. Um, yeah, Phantom of the and, Opera. Yeah, and he he wants to do the Phantom, but he's not going to do that to his own face, and it's too horrible to actually be someone's real face. So what he needs to do, he needs to find a face to work from and torture it and 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 maim it, mutilate it into becoming the Phantom, right? Because the Phantom has a half his face is like disfigured. And so he finds this one guy, and he thinks this guy will, will you know, will be the the face that he wants to use for uh, well, Raul Phantom. This is also the guy that just happens to be marrying the woman that he's in love with. So that helps, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, he's like that helps he's like the... a handsome leading man that that uh, is not really that good at acting. Yeah, that helps in pinpointing. First, because he offends his sensibility as an actor because the guy's a ham. Second, yeah. because, you know, he's trying to seduce the woman he loves. And third, you know, why not? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a way to mix everything, uh, yeah. pleasure and revenge and uh, get his his phantom. Yeah. And so I, I, it's cool that the phantom is a sketch of actually Lon, Lon Chaney's uh, Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Really yeah, cool. it is. Yeah. So meanwhile, the cops are on his trail, and uh, just as the guy is maiming uh, Norman and uh, getting ready to he's like pouring disfigure acid, his face. acid on his face, yeah. Yeah, that's when the cops show up, and uh, they interrupt him, and he's like, you know, they interrupt him, and he's like, no, this is going to be my greatest performance. I was going to play the Phantom of the Opera, and everybody was going to remember my face. Kind of like what people do with Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera. I mean... That makeup was uh, amazing. I mean, he had like wire going up in his face, piano wire and putty, and yeah. he completely worked out of his own kit. I mean, he basically made all, all his makeups. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, imagine stretching piano wire and gluing it to your nose so you could pull it back and then putting like more piano wire around your eyes so you could like open up your eyes a little. And it's, it's just amazing. That must have yeah, been super uncomfortable for him to use and super painful. But so the cops interrupt him and, uh, and while he's fighting them, that's when his desire calls out Pinhead, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Pinhead and the Cenobites come and, and uh, get him. Well, I guess there's only Pinhead. They didn't really. Oh, and Face. It's just Pinhead. Oh, no, he becomes Face. That's right. That's where he we He becomes learn Face, yeah. yeah he becomes right. Face. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Pinhead recognized his talent, I guess. He's like, you know, you have a talent. He, we've been kind of guiding you a little bit here and there, nudging you, showing you how you could take people's faces off. And now that you've kind of graduated, you're you're coming to hell with me. And so, and then it, it cuts to him in hell narrating his story. And he's like, hey, you know, now I'm face. I got a face for every occasion. Um, you know, they, the, the, the faces that he takes don't, don't rot in hell. So, yeah. and, um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and Pinhead, his teacher, is saying, you've adapted very well. You know, Leviathan is pleased. And <laughs> there's you can this see like, Pinhead actually smile. Yeah, yeah he's you know, smiling. Kind of seem- yeah. And Faith says, well, I've been using staples recently to graft them on, but I think I'm thinking more about screws for, you know, the next stage. And it's like, yeah. oh, wow. So they just walk away chatting with each other. Yeah. And that's Faith. That's the origin of Faith, the Cenobite. In, in this issue, in the foreword, uh, Dan uh, Dan Chichester says that the, their editor, Margaret C- uh, Clark, had left and she was going to be replaced by a new guy, Mark McLaurin. And then in the afterward, Mark McLaurin writes that. It's kind of interesting. He talks about the essence of horror and what he yeah what he thinks horror should be and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, and Clive Barker's Hellraiser will certainly be opening a great many doors, and there's no telling what we may let out. We'll be back in just three months with a whole new labyrinth, so stick around. I still have that broken doorknob. <laughs> so that's Mark and McLaurin. And they were starting to speed it up a bit more, right? They were starting to yeah. put them out uh, faster now. Yeah, so. it seems like they're a little more organized, and they they had a few regular writers. Yeah, and the end uh, and the back cover, the end uh, text that they have reminds me of the Books of Blood in a way. It says, "Winding and wicked are the roads to hell, roads filled with actors trading masks of comedy and tragedy for ones of human flesh." Roads backed with vets whose wars could never leave enough scars to please the Cenobites. Roads paved with lost travelers offering their souls for a final glimpse of the light. But there are shortcuts to hell as well, mapped out inside these pages by the infernal imaginings of Clive Barker. They're guaranteed to get you down below in style. Getting back <laughs> is your problem. <laughs> I love this stuff. Yeah, it yeah, reminds me of cool. the winding roads in the, the afterlife, you know, the, the, the books of blood. Yeah. Um, right. That's a great... The dead have highways. Dead have highways, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's Hellraiser 1 through 4. We have 20 to go, so we'll have four more episodes of this. Yeah, yeah, at least. Okay, cool. Um, I love these comic books. They're like yeah, little graphic too. novels. Uh, I like them as much as I like the Eclipse adaptations of the Books of Blood. I think this was like part of the golden age of Clyde Barker and Marvel Comics. Um I wish they would bring them back. I wish that we would have like a Hellraiser Anthology Volume 3 coming out from Seraphin. I don't know if that's going to crystallize in the future. Hope it does. Because they've really gotten some grade A talent to join Hellraiser Anthology. Like Riley Schmidt. uh, Mr. Sam. Yeah. uh, Daniel Serra. And all those like awesome you know, uh, artists that they brought into the fold for Hellraiser Anthology. It's been a great, a great job by the people at Seraphin. Um, and it's, it's in the same spirit. Uh, it's like the same successor of, it's a great successor to these comic books. I wasn't that thrilled about the Boom Studio Hellraiser comics because I just thought it, they went in directions that I wasn't super interested in, but. Um, I liked, I liked it in parts. Yeah. yeah, and I think that uh, I think that it, sometimes it went off the rails, and I think it just was too many cooks in the kitchen, like too much, too many right. people passing the story off onto somebody else, and and it wasn't I mean, uh, it wasn't an anthology first. series like like these are. So you know, the next writer had to pick it up where the last one left off. 
Right. I didn't right. read the Boom the Boom series, but when I saw that Harry Demore was a Cenobite or something like that, I just thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> you know? that, that was, I liked uh, ideas like Kirsty. Yeah. Yeah. Ideas like Kirsty becoming Pinhead in the uh, Boom comics were good ideas, and I think they really could have explore that uh further but um but yeah you know you know i mean uh, tiffany being brought back was also interesting um, yeah yeah and having her own harrowers and stuff i just wish they gave us more backstory and how they got to be that team you know it's like usually they would be like oh we're just gonna go to paris now we're gonna go to germany and now we're gonna go to this place it's like how are you guys doing this what yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> and and why don't you guys change your costume from like city to city it's always like the same the same costumes that they have on. It's like, yeah. it's weird. It should have like different clothings in different <laughs> times. Yeah. Uh, it didn't really seem like time passed when they were jumping from city to city. And it's like, I just didn't understand that very well. But um, these comics were amazing. This was like really good grade A talent being brought into the fold for this Marvel series. And uh, I really recommend it. It's they're really amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, high quality, glossy paper, graphic novel quality and anthology series have the challenge of having to do little short stories and short stories can either go really good or really bad. Well, um, and if a short story is really bad, it doesn't bring the whole book down, which is nice. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So they have all sometimes four, maybe five stories per issue. So, yeah. you know, you always get something really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and so coming up next, we'll be uh, we'll be co returning to the duels of blood in just one week. The um, first round will be over. So if you didn't get a chance to vote, go over and vote for your favorite Cenobites at duels of blood dot com. And um, and first then, round ends on March 22nd. Yep. Yep. So that'll be that'll be I think that's Friday. And then and then our new episode talking about it will be the following Sunday. And Thanks to Simon Banford for uh, posting the link to our Duels of Blood, and Paul yeah. T. Taylor is yeah, also Pat getting Taylor. People Thank yeah. you. Yep, so riled got, up to vote for his pinhead. We've got some Cenobites fighting for us, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> or fighting for their uh, for their 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 characters. And yeah. it, it was funny. Did you see Peter Atkins' <laughs> comments? Like you put me up against. Uh... Skinless Julia. He says, "I don't." He's I like, "Come on, he's I like, didn't even vote for myself." <laughs> I didn't even vote for my guy. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter. It was yeah. randomized. Yeah, it was yeah. totally randomized. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks a lot for your feedback, guys. And keep voting. You can vote every five minutes. So go ahead and vote for your favorite Cenobites. I see there's a lot of votes coming in, so it's going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it. Uh, and this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. I think literally this time. We were like om almost three hours. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.cliveparkercast.com where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Sarah Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.